there's a window open. Economic crisis and a constitutional crisis coming to a head. We're going to be going through some shit. Look at history and acknowledge that things like this can happen, things like this have happened, things like this are happening right now. The gray state is a part of this Orwellian nightmare that's being set up. Their vision for what's next is a global fed and even more power. The potential complete collapse of America, of a global economy. One world government, new world order. It's real. A lot of people are realizing it and uh, more people are going to have to. You are a slave. The system is failing us. And the bottom line is that something has to be done. This is an empire in decline. If we don't do something drastic to put the federal government in check, we're going to be doing things the hard way with a violent collapse. We are already beginning to fall to the gray state. We're already halfway there. This is the path we're already on. Civil war is staring us in the face. Trends like the slow yielding of our quiet American towns to a choking array of federal surveillance grids, illegal police checkpoints, and literal foreign occupation. That is exactly the kind of abuse of power that led to the first American Revolution. What is it that keeps it from happening in the United States? Is this the kind of world I want to live in? The gray state is a symptom. The disease is statism. The morality that we expect ourselves to adhere to, the standards of, of behavior and conduct, like when you were taught in kindergarten, don't hit and don't steal, it wasn't unless you're a cop or an IRS agent. You know, and when you learned thou shalt not kill, it wasn't unless your dear leader gives you a gun and a badge and a one-way ticket to the other side of the world. Those were moral absolutes, but what we are doing now is institutionalizing them in government and creating this moral exception for people that have the socially granted monopoly on the initiation of force over a given geographical area by calling it government and pretending that it's good for us. The only thing that makes the government different from any other organization is the government has the ability to compel people to do things via force. You gotta look at that whole idea that it's okay for us to do this, but not for you to do this. They want you to feel defeated, they want you to feel powerless, and that is how they basically get away with rape, theft, and murder. It's like massive Stockholm Syndrome. We see it every day. We see it in the news. We see it on headlines, but people still don't acknowledge it. We are already living in a world where government has become a detriment to human liberty by any measure at, at such an obvious level. We are already going into a scientifically designed Orwellian control system that is meant to use humans up like natural resources. The stripping of your rights, your liberties, your freedom, private property, even your free will. That is a great state. And yes, it is real. And yes, it is here. The free enterprise system is based off five features, economic freedom, incentives, competition, voluntary exchange, and private property. Basically, we believe as free market economists that people have a right to private property, that prices are driven from the market, people that are buying and selling goods and services. Whereas a socialist system doesn't have those features. Then you talk more about public property and what can the state control versus what can the individual control. If I buy something from you, it's because I value your product 
worth more than my money and you are gonna value that money more than that product. And we both benefit. Anytime you introduce force into that equation in any form, you subtract from humanity's potential to reach that ideal of prosperity and progress. You can't force someone by law to buy something. Otherwise, voluntary exchange doesn't exist. You can see that with Obamacare, different mandates for consumers to, to purchase various goods and services. Uh, so that is a progression towards socialism. You're mandated to purchase certain items from the state. Individual people can do much better in bringing up an entire economic society by themselves and not being ordered to do certain things, you know, command economies, that sort of thing. That's why all command economies essentially fail. That's what they did in Europe. You couldn't keep the benefits of your own labor, your own hard work and sweat. It would be confiscated by some corporate entity that had control over the monetary system. We had a nation of producers. We had a nation of people who were free to innovate and create and then be allowed to reap the benefits of that creativity. If you invented the television set, the state's not going to come in and say, we're confiscating that from you for the public good. You were then allowed to market it. It generated wealth, savings of money. You had more and more local hardware stores competing against each other. When you have greater competition, you have reduction in prices. Obviously, the people who can provide the highest quality product, the lowest price, are going to win out. Those who cannot will fail. That's what a free market is. It's the freedom to succeed and fail. It's a simple fact of the superiority of using persuasion to get people to do what you want to do, as opposed to saying, well, I'm scared and I don't trust you and I'm going to just have someone with government put a gun to your head and do what I want you to do. When people give money to Bill Gates or Sam Walton, he's not taking it from them. They're getting something in return. They're getting a service. They're getting a product. There is an organization out there that does take the money from you, and that's the government. If you live in the United States and you work in the United States, you fall under our jurisdiction. Does that mean that everyone in North America is a slave to your company? I don't work for a company. Oh, you work for the IRS. Is everyone is a slave to the IRS? I believe that I do have jurisdiction. I believe it is valid. I believe I do have those rights. Yes. Okay, but you 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 can't by your own admission ask, answer a question regarding evidence that actually proves that there's jurisdiction. You right. Right. Just so you have you faith can't answer those questions. So you have faith that you have jurisdiction. You don't have any actual evidence and you're not qualified to determine if there is evidence to back that assertion up. Correct. Blind faith. That's really impressive when you're talking about other people's property and other people's lives. To have blind faith in, 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 in a violent, aggressive system. You don't have a choice about whether or not you can do business with the government. If you uh, don't want to use our services, that's fine, but you're still going to pay for those services. If you don't have kids, you're still going to pay for public school. If you're not sick, you're still going to pay for health care. And if you don't pay, we're going to send people with guns to take your money and take your house and take you. The feudal era, you had a feudal king or lord who would claim half of your crops in exchange for protection. And because the peasants didn't know any better, they could get away with that scam. Hey, give me 20 bucks or I'll shoot you or I'll throw you in prison, which is you know, what taxes are. No one pays taxes because they want to. Taxes are collected at the barrel of a gun. All laws are enforced at the barrel of a gun. Now, the facade of statism has to include them throwing us a lot of bones. You know, when a farmer will provide health care for his livestock in the same way that a government wants to keep the tax cows healthy and productive. They bribe us with our own money. They tax us, and then they take that money and they push it back out. What they hope we don't notice is they take that money from us in the first place. Without the income tax, America historically became the wealthiest country on earth because it goes back to the benefits of a savings-based economy where you're able to accumulate savings and you're not forced to turn it over to a governing authority to redistribute as it sees fit. If you have a business, you're supposed to file as your business expenses, your business accounts, you know, nonprofits, everything else. But you as an individual, there's no law stating that you have to file taxes on your income. that your income tax is a farce. The 16th Amendment of the United States was never properly ratified by Congress. 
people today believe that taxation is absolutely necessary. Like Winston Churchill said, it's the penalty for living in a civil society. This is not true. We lived without an income tax. New Hampshire today still exists without the income tax. And they're thriving. They're doing fine. You, you think it's moral to force people to follow your rules. And you think that's moral. You think it's, it's, it's moral to force people to do what you want and to pay you. And we don't believe it's moral to force people on the threat to well, I, I disagree with the word force. Yeah. Well, I disagree with the word force, but I think it's moral that you should have to pay your taxes, absolutely. So it's, it's moral to force people to pay for services they may or may not want. Yes, it is moral to pay for things that you may or may not want. So by doing things voluntarily and, and not using aggressive force and asking questions, that to you is immoral. But the opposite of being involuntary, using aggressive force and not questioning, that's moral to you. One reason why the income tax is so detrimental, it's based on the assumption that the government owns everything and they allow us to keep a certain percentage under their conditions. Which proves the point that even a 1% income tax is morally wrong because it sows the seeds of destruction. The gray state is a symptom of the step backwards of statism that we're experiencing right now. Two steps forward, one step backwards is, is the course of human progress. And I can look back and say, well, we started the major step backward in 1913 that was the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve legislation was drafted on an island, really called Jekyll Island. And all these bankers, the heads of J.P. Morgan and the other large banks at the time got together on this island, secretly drafted the legislation and all that stuff. I think that name is perfect, the creature from Jekyll Island. It's this creature. The Congress was on leave for Christmas. They had a silent vote, less than 10 votes. They actually got through. And all of a sudden, the Fed Board of Governors became the all-powerful entity. So what you did was you gave someone a monopoly, and then they brought that monopoly into D.C. No different than the IMF today, no different than all the corporations and all the guilds, all the unions that are coming to D.C. to seek their monopoly favors. So basically what it is is that the Federal Reserve is 80% owned privately. We got to print our currency, depicts our interest rates, tells us how much commodity products are. There's nothing federal about the Federal Reserve. It's a private establishment owned and run by offshore banks. The Federal Reserve is a criminal organization. Did you people know that America doesn't even own its own money supply? Within our Constitution, to be able to print our own money, Congress should have control over it. The Federal Reserve uh, took that away. This private central authority is going to loan money to your government at interest so they make money off that debt. And then the federal government pays them back plus interest via taxation. And basically it prints false money, uh, money out of thin air. I look at it as the age-old struggle of the philosopher's stone where he used to try and find a way back in the old days to create gold, which was money and always has been money, out of lead. And they never could figure out a way to do it. So that's sort of like the rapture occurred when they realized we can substitute gold with paper money, which we can create infinitely at a very low cost. When they want to spend more than they make off the revenue from the people, that's where they borrow money from the Federal Reserve. Basically, uh, open it a credit card. So this debt is only valid so far as our public is able to cover that debt based upon our level of income taxes. Federal income taxes does one thing, and that's it. When you pay taxes on your income, that goes directly to the Federal Reserve to pay interest on the debt that they create. Anybody not understand that? Anything they cannot pay for via taxation, they turn on the printing presses. At this point, it's analogous to a Mickey Mantle rookie baseball card. You give some governing authority the right to create photocopies of this, pass them off, it's the same thing. What's going to happen to the existing value of all other Mickey Mantle signed rookie cards in good condition? Well, they used to be rare, so they had value. Now they eliminated demand. They took us off the gold standard. They took us off the oil standard. Oil is now traded in euros and other currencies, so there's not as much incentive to invest in the United States. And now they're increasing the supply. So you have declining demand, and you have greater supply. Many a country has tried this in the past. It ends up badly. You can't just print money and say it's worth something. That's only going to work for so long. What gives our paper its value is its world reserve status. Every currency on Earth is backed to some degree or some percentage by US dollars. What used to give that 
value was that it was backed by something else of value. In our case, we had the highest gold reserves of any country on earth. We had an agreement under Bretton Woods with Saudi Arabia and OPEC, you know, the oil and petroleum exporting nations of the world, that their oil would only be traded exclusively in U.S. dollars. Every other country on earth had to buy U.S. treasuries and convert their currency to U.S. dollars to get oil, which every economy needs to function, of course. That was the key to our prosperity in the early days. It's an illusion, it's a mass delusion to say that a Northern Ireland pound has intrinsic value. It's only valuable if somebody takes it. And uh, if you go try to spend that down in London, nine times out of 10, people say, I don't want that. That's not real money. That's not a British pound. It's a symbolic representation of, of an exchange medium. And that's the beauty of gold, silver, and other commodities. They don't lose their value. It just is what it is. It discourages moral hazard and unnecessary risk. If you couldn't afford it, you didn't buy it. This was not poverty. This was responsibility. So they're funneling all this money that otherwise didn't exist. They're creating it literally out of thin air, loaning it to the banks, and they loan it at interest. You go to a bank, you get a loan, they uh, basically transfer that money out of thin air into your account, and it's a debt. But it came out of nowhere, so technically that's fraud. Since the 1970s, we, we did not have the ability to cover our debts via taxation. It's not popular to raise taxes. You're not going to vote for the politician who does that because that gets old. But we hate it when they stop spending. We like the free goodies. So that's why it is we're in such a deficit crisis and they spend so much money. It's, it's popular to spend. It's unpopular to tax. So what do we do? We have the Federal Reserve paper it over. The problem is Congress, the federal bureaucracy, and the military bureaucracies. And remember what runs those things, cash. When you fly into Ronald Reagan National Airport, as you're getting ready to land, if you look towards the Washington Monument, you will see this enormous mountain of cash. The problem with that mountain of cash is it's a magnet for all the wrong people. Everybody in the Beltway exists to get their hands on some of that cash. It essentially creates a situation in which everyone is for sale. Again, to go back to the Mayor Amschel Rothschild quote, who is the founder of the Bank of England, the grammy control over nation's currency, I care not who makes its laws. Now, they do not directly influence public opinion, the laws, or anything like that. They do so, however, indirectly, because they control the money, so they care not who makes the laws, because they can use that money, which they can create in perpetuity out of nothing, and give it to their preferred representatives in government, and help shape the agenda. In every administration, there has been someone or multiple people associated to the Federal Reserve. Isn't that interesting? Why is that? People when getting into office can borrow money from the Federal Reserve directly for their political campaigns. They necessarily don't have to pay that money back out of their own savings or their own donations. They just leave that as national debt that the United States owes the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is happy to create that debt because every dollar created, they get more interest paid back to them. Once they've taken this money from the Federal Reserve, it's like selling your soul to the devil. You don't really have a choice in which bills you pass or which ones you vote no or yes for. Listen, there isn't much altruism when you're flooded with cash. That is one very insidious way that the Federal Reserve impacts public policy. And they use, again, these various roundtable groups as a conduit to accomplish this indirectly. So it doesn't look like the Federal Reserve doing it. But that's ultimately what happens. How long have they been trying to do this? Forever. Right. Bankers are like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you let them do it. What you need is gutsy presidents, gutsy Congress people to prevent it. Obama's entire cabinet stems from the Federal Reserve. If you don't believe me, look it up. It's a win-win situation for government to spend. Mm -hmm. It's something that government's never going to be held accountable for. It's a way of free money for them. The elite used the banking and financial industries as a mode of control because either you're owned by them or you owe money to them. So either way, it's it's kind of like this leash of control around everybody. Today, if you create an invention, you're much less likely to run a company 
that employs people for very long because you're going to have a very large bank or a very large corporate entity come in and simply buy your product. It essentially allows them to confiscate the creativity of you and I, of regular people. It allows them to not produce, to not achieve, to not create something of a great value that the public will demand and consume. They didn't have to do that themselves. All they had to do was control the monetary supply. And they can then buy up for pennies on the dollar, essentially, your creation, your innovation, and market it to the masses. And then they can siphon off millions in taxpayer dollars for having produced nothing. As humans, we're designed to worry about the next tribe coming over and attacking our clan. And men are designed to look out towards the horizon and see threats. But we only see military threats or criminal threats or thugs. We have not been designed to see corporate threats where global corporations get their people into government, then the traitors in government create new systems and sign government authority over to that. The conspiracy is one of human nature and the moneyed power is using that moneyed influence to appeal to people's own based instincts and their own self-centeredness. You have to ultimately, in a free market, assume the risks and responsibilities associated with the freedom, again, to succeed and the freedom to fail. We don't have that. What you have today is a corporatocracy. You can essentially fail and you don't have to worry because you're going to get bailed out by the taxpayer. That's not a free market. We don't have a free market. We have intertwined corporate interests, right. We have the hydra of these corporations that are addicted to cheap money and free credit created by a privately owned corporation that monopolizes the creation of money. So the Federal Reserve is going to create Mickey Mantle baseball cards ad nauseum and infinitum. They're going to just print them out to cover all these bad debts that went wrong when Goldman Sachs, Federal Reserve shareholder decided to sell a whole bunch of these uh, securitized mortgages thanks to the repeal of Glass-Steagall to foreign investors all over the world that went bad and they knew would go bad. The fraud element comes in, they knew they were going to go bad. So the Federal Reserve creates moral hazard again for these large banks by saying, don't worry, we'll paper it over. We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis and the federal government is responding with decisive action. Over 700 points. Apple shares are just getting hammered. We're down by between three and four and a half percent. A national rescue plan. $85 billion deal. The worst economic crisis facing the United States. There are going to be ominous consequences. We're in the last days of this country surviving. Supply urgently needed money, so banks and other financial institutions can avoid collapse and resume lending. We bailed out the guys that created this mess. And, and those are the last people that should be bailed out. These people shouldn't be granted a free pass. Not passing a bill now would cost these Americans much more later. The the they were bankrupt, and instead, they got the and we got the bankruptcy. People accepted it. They were like, yes, good. Well, at least we have jobs. At least the banks are okay, because that's where our money goes. And every time they manufacture a depression in the marketplace, they receive a bailout, smaller competitors do not, so they can buy up the assets, again, the things of tangible, actual value from the productive people in the economy, and they're confiscating it on pennies on the dollar, because when you're liquidating in a Chapter 11 bankruptcy situation, you're gonna take whatever you can get. Then Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America can swoop in, take control of all those assets. They didn't produce anything, they didn't make anyone's life better, but uh, they're rolling in the dough, aren't they? The primary problems here is that there's an absolute unification of money and power and government. And you need to try, for the sake of uh, sanity and liberty, to try and prize those things apart. Because at the moment, they are one. Is this triangle corruption leads to secrecy and incompetence. But it just breeds all this and they just want to keep everything quiet. In the Roman period, they used to talk about bread and circuses as entertainment for quote unquote the mob. Let's increase prosperity and standard of living. Everybody gets to drive a better car. Everybody gets to live in a nicer home. And what we really want people to do is go to the mall and shop and be entertained. They've been very successful in turning the body of the American population into sedated consumers. Well, you can only sedate the consumer so long. When the consumer runs out of his ability to consume, when he suddenly wakes up and recognizes that what he thought he had, he doesn't, the money he thought he had is gone, the wealth he, he was promised is, is vanished. That's when the game is up.
today inside Washington. The mainstream mentality is that you and I and the rest of us that are talking in these terms are out of touch with reality. They cannot begin to comprehend what you and I are discussing today. And I think that's very important for your viewers to understand. Our banking system is a safe and a sound one. Our deficit problems are completely manageable. Everything will be fine. We'll pass some reforms, some new legislation. We'll make it all right. Part of the scam of government by printing money, by borrowing money, we don't have to tax people directly. We can commit intergenerational child abuse and pass that bill off to the, the people who are unborn, who when born into America have a $45,000 stone around their neck as their share of just the federal debt in its most conservatively estimated forms. People keep throwing around these numbers that were 15 trillion in debt, 16, 17. Those are all old numbers. It came out in Bloomberg Financial and other news outlets that under Obama's administration in the first two years, over 23.7 trillion is missing. And those are old numbers. And that's on top of all the missing trillion from Bush. You had $1 million and you started counting one at a time. It would take you 11 and a half days to get to 1 million. If you were going to count to a billion, it would take you 31.7 years. In one trillion seconds, it's 31,700 years. That's the difference between a million, a billion, and a trillion. So a million seconds ago, 11 and a half days ago, a billion seconds ago, 1980, a trillion seconds ago, 29,688 BC. The way Bush has done it over the last eight years is to take out a credit card from the Bank of China in the name of our children, driving up our national debt Raising the debt ceiling, which has done, been done over a hundred times, does not increase our debt. We have now seen our national debt go to the tune of $211 trillion, if you consider all the government guarantees to workers for their retirements and their pensions, etc. We're at a point now where if you were to tax the American public to the tune of 100% of their income for the next 20 years, you wouldn't put a dent in the interest. And we see the economy falling apart. And before people said, you know, I can't really believe that this is all by design. How do just tens of trillions of dollars go missing? And then Ben Bernanke, the Fed chairman, just laughs at congressmen and senators when they ask him, hey, where's the missing trillions? Some of the heads who were in charge of the accounting said, we just don't know where it went. When everybody's struggling in this economy, Ben Bernanke's out celebrating at this huge gala event with all these rich, elite, powerful people. And meanwhile, there's children starving. What'd you do at the 2008 Bilderberg meeting? I'm not doing any press today. For people in high office and high places, there is no accountability. And they like that. And it's a wonderful situation to be in. Never having to answer for, for what you've done. If the government deliberately devalues and destroys the valuable currency, it will destroy the middle class and the wealth will gravitate to the wealthy. So when you print money, you literally expand the gap between rich and poor. We are in debt, our kids are in debt, our grandchildren are in debt. It is time to stop. When the United States defaults on its debt, which it will, to the Federal Reserve. It's not a question if, it's a question when. Each citizen has been placed on collateral, which is a social security number. So that means when it defaults on the debt, it's going to go to its collateral, which is you and me. So first of all, when you're born, you're enslaved. Look at your identifications. Your name is all in capitals. That means you're a corporation. That's your serial number. That's your ticket number. Everybody's given one of these when you were born, OK? That's your PIN number, meaning that you're going to pay interest to the Federal Reserve System you know, as you grow up and get older, because the Federal Reserve borrows against us as debtors. This? Proving the fact that you're a number. And if I recall, back in 2009, I think it was, they said that people with incomes are a threat to their agenda. It seems to me that they want to make sure that the people don't have any money to fight back. Just even the little crumbs. We have pulled this economy back from the brink. There is no recovery. Everyone is going to feel this, even if they're not feeling it now. Well, the, the thing that, that my baseball coach as a child taught me the most is that in life you are going to lose. Well, we can't have a society of winners. There's but, not that many college students in the world, right? I get up and I work every day for family and generations after me. I just don't know what their lives are going to be like. You know, that's my biggest fear is what are we all going to pay for 50 years from now. Our deficits are to such a degree that when you cannot cover it via taxation, no one's willing to loan you money anymore. That's what we've been doing. We've been borrowing our way 
to financial prosperity from foreign central banks and they won't lend to us anymore because they know mathematically we cannot pay it back via taxation. Bottom line, that's what this is about. They're just creating money, they're devaluing it, and there's no alternative. The, the direction we're going in right now is debt and dependency. You understand the principles of the debt super cycle. And eventually that super cycle comes to an end because you can only print and borrow so much money. You've seen the dot-com bubble, you've seen the housing bubble, and, now, and if you understand the Austrian school, we're already building that next bubble. The U.S. Treasury bond is the largest bubble out there, bigger than the credit card and the education bubble. It's several times bigger, and they're going to discover this unfortunate fact very painfully. And what happens then in times of economic crises is you go back to the world reserve currency, you buy up U.S. Treasury bills because it's a store of value. What's happening today is you're seeing that panicked flight to safety into the U.S. dollar, but the dollar's not going up in value. It's still very gradually going down in value. All it's going to take for us to crumble financially is for the world leaders to drop the dollar. They can dump that on our market at any time. Create overnight hyperinflation. It means all commerce shuts down. Well, if you know that in six months, your dollars are going to lose 20% of the value, you're not going to hold on to them and save them, which is what we depend upon. You're sure as hell not going to back your currency by them. You're going to buy shit up while the buying's good. You see it now? You got China out buying up infrastructure all over the United States, Russia doing the same thing. So they're taking these worthless US dollars and they're buying up this country. And then there'll be a flight to safety in commodities, gold, silver, etc., to save what you have left. So essentially, at some point, all of the world's banks are going to dump dollars. And those dollars are going to start chasing goods and services. And as the means of production becomes more and more handicapped by government intervention, more and more regulation, less people are going to invest, the whole thing falls apart. Now, look at the news. You see this is happening right now. The smartest minds in the world are saying these bonds are cooked. We've had it. The rally is over. The long-awaited bond apocalypse is happening. And I think it is happening in the next month, two months, three months. It's happening now. So what is real wealth? Is it in a paper currency again? No, that's just paper. It's kindling, it's something to write on, it's something to wipe your backside with. What does that paper get you? Goods and services. What does a bank confiscate? Do they come after your paper? No, they come after your house. They come after your cars. They come after the actual goods and services that had the value to begin with. And that's why everyone who's inside the Beltway is so desperate to convince everyone it won't happen. Because there is no way to avoid it anymore. The economy is going to be OK keep them working because you don't want to create pandemonium. You start getting the people too scared about what's going on and start fearing the government, then they're going to have a revolution. They can't have that. They want to keep it on the tipping point where they have control. They're going to use our own money to enslave us and collapse the monetary system at the same time because, again, every currency on Earth is backed by U.S. dollars. If there's nothing to replace it, you only have chaos. In June of 1929, Mr. Mellon, who was the Secretary of the Treasury, told the American people that they lived in an era of unbroken prosperity, that they had nothing to fear. At the same time, he was liquidating all of his investments in the market. He was putting everything into cash and gold. He wasn't alone. Mr. Geithner recently made the statement that our banks are solvent, that there is no issue. We have nothing to be concerned about. Nothing could be further from the truth. The whole idea about conditioning the kids is the idea of creating a new generation that thinks differently than the previous generation. Teaching the kids that they should think a certain way, or they should feel a certain way, or they should vote a certain way. In the late 1800s, you have the emergence of psychology, the study of psychology, how people think and how people can specifically be manipulated. 
If you're familiar with the psychology of B.F. Skinner, what he would have you believe is that human beings are not creatures of introspection. They're not creatures of internal cognition. They have no soul, they have no thought processes, they have no free will. What they are are animals to be trained. So you have Skinner's operant conditioning chamber, or the Skinner box, where he trains mice to perform for him based on a system of punishment and reward. Essentially what it does is it bypasses brain function and goes straight to an animal training method. You create a problem, offer a solution that drives them toward a pre-designed response. This is called the Hegelian dialectic. The Hegelian dialectic is a formula and a strategy for creating a problem to then offer a solution that you have to the very problem that you've created to get the outcome that you desire that you wouldn't have been able to get if you didn't create the problem in the first place. The Hegelian social theory was adopted by Lenin, by Marx, and it was applied politically in the form of communism and socialism. A German psychologist, Wilhelm Wundt, he is the first one to apply it to education. For 85% of the American population, what is school supposed to do? Provide a path to employment and good citizenship. I'm not going to go into a lot of great depth and detail in the Council of Foreign Relations, but you're looking at an organization essentially set up by Rockefeller and other central bankers, people who are responsible for the creation of the Federal Reserve to debate education policy in the United States. It used to be that education was run by the states. Today you have funding and financing taking place with the federal government, whereby if public schooling systems don't do what they want, they get their funding cut. The Reese Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, and the Rockefeller Foundation, all these major foundations that can actually give American taxpayer subsidies subsidized grants to individuals who do things according to their criteria. A tax credit is when you get to keep your money because of some reason. A subsidy is when I, the government, actually collect that money and then I turn around and pick a certain behavior that I want and then I subsidize that. This was revealed in the book Lines of Credit, Ropes of Bondage, in which H.R. Gaither of the Ford Foundation revealed to Norman Dodd of the Reese Foundation that they were taking their directives from the White House. The American education system is a combination of the Gillian social theory and experimental psychology. They destroy things like competition between students because if they tell you there's no competition, there's no reason to exceed, there's no reason to excel, there's no incentive for upward mobility, there's animal training for the workforce. So you have to attack the families, you have to say parents aren't fit to be parents. So the state has to come in and control that. And then you have to control what the children are eating, what they're being fed, I mean, what they're being taught, what they're watching because you have to begin to set up the generation gaps. And that's the whole idea behind working with the kids and dealing with our kids, this concept of in local parentis, that the school is the parents when the parents are not there. Most people are too busy working the nine to five, and now that nine to five is turning into nine to nine to be able to just survive, crippling the amount of time we have to transfer knowledge and information to our children or our young. So by making sure both parents are away from the children, at work, they can guarantee that the social environment of school, preschool, daycare is going to be able to give the children the knowledge that they want to. And what you have is the degradation of the individual, you have the promotion of the state, and you have the elimination of the middle class. Now under this operant conditioning from Skinner and under a system of reward and punishment, the only thing you learn is how not to get punished and how to achieve your reward. You're not going to come away from this system thinking, I'm going to stand up for something because it's right. You're going to do it because there's either reward or consequence involved. They're being trained to enter the workforce as a valueless cog in the state. I'm a product of the public school system and nobody ever taught me anything. I mean, I think we read the Declaration of Independence in the fifth grade, possibly. But I think the, the, the school systems are designed to, to keep people uninformed and to not understand the scope of their rights and where they come from. I think the powers that be would, would ultimately love everyone to believe that their rights come from the state. It takes about 20 years for this sort of system of thought to instill itself in a generation, unchecked by traditional values. What you see is the same system employed by Stalin. 
And basically this is being done in America right now. We're developing them to not question authority. We're developing them to be entitled, that the government will take care of them from cradle to grave. These efforts have been pretty successful. No one questions their shackles if they're born into them. Jewel beads. Jewel beads. We have whole generations of kids that are being raised to not think like free people, to think like slaves, to think like they don't have self-determination. The state's goal is to get your children to turn against you in the name of the state. And that's where we are shifting now. We are shifting from an individualistic paradigm to groupthink. They want to be led. They want to be sheep. They want to be part of the masses. Critical reason, critical thought, individualism. I mean, those are huge concepts. I mean, they're universal concepts, but to be able to control the masses, you have to get rid of that. Because if you don't, you can't control those people. It's the alleviation of personal responsibility because the experts are in control, let them handle it. shouldn't exist. We ought to be voting for a candidate based upon principles, character, things like that. It keeps us from being able to fight over party lines. If you look today, you have party platforms. These are things that we all have to agree on. And if not, you are not a part of this party. Well, look at Ron Paul right now. He's against taxation. Well, a lot of people in the GOP, we like that. But he's against the war as well. You must be one of those Democrats then. The old saying, divide and conquer. So they try to just divide people into two different groups so that you can't unify. It's easier to manage a population when you have two primary belief systems. You're either A or you're B. These people are conditioned to think a certain way and support a certain team. You know, they pick their winning team, whether it's Democrat or Republican, and then that's their guy. And it doesn't matter what that person votes for. As long as their guy wins, they put their pen up whether it's got a donkey or an elephant on it, and they wave it and they say, my guy won, things are going to be different. It's so much easier to lie to the masses when the masses aren't involved. There's no better way to discourage the masses from getting involved than by creating convoluted, controlled dialogue based upon party platforms versus individual principle. They'll say out of one corner of their mouth that they want you to vote, they want you to participate, and then we notice statistically that there's less participation today than there ever has been. And that's exactly the way they want it. It's all theater, it's just political theater. We go from rule based on constitutional law to rule based on a cult of personality. Well, he might be wrong, but he's my president, so I'm gonna stand with him. That's a very dangerous mode of thinking. Do you support freedom in the American Constitution or do you support this person? We've all seen where that led in Cambodia and Russia and Germany. Cheney. Everybody's got to obey the laws, including the president and vice president. Vote for Democrats. Obama, yeah. Woo. I'm sure if you ask the average Obama supporter if they have good intentions or not, you know, they're going to say, of course. The path to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, Obama's just as bad as the rest of them. Why do you say that? What's he done? He's one of the most war-hungry presidents we've ever seen. He has not fulfilled any of his policies that he promised at all. The economy is still tanked. The taxes are still high. I'll make our government open and transparent. One of my priorities as president is opening up the White House to the American people. That White House tour will be canceled till further notice. I intend to close Guantanamo, and I will follow through on that. We will bring an end to this war. I will be held accountable. These are bills that Congress ran up. You will not see your taxes increase one single time. Cut the deficit we inherited by half. If I don't have this done in three years, then there's going to be a one-term proposition. If you had a spouse who broke their promise 95% of the time, you'd get a divorce. This is all fact, but people still support him. Obama's name is in uh, the Bible. I prayed and I believe that God picked the right president. 
Americans. The Obamanoids. You're going to have 20 to 25 percent of the American public who will always support Obama no matter what he does because their own ego is on the line and they won't admit it. Actually, those are not facts. What you just stated, those wasn't facts. Everybody's happy to re-elect President Obama. Yeah! What's your favorite thing about President Obama? I could list a million different reasons. It's truthful. He's for public education and he wants to restore it back to where it belongs. Yes, everybody in Cleveland, no minority got Obama phone. Keep Obama in president, you know? He gave us a phone. Healthcare. Healthcare, yeah. His public speaking skills are immaculate. Yeah. He's so smart and he was funny as captivating. <laughs> understand where we come from as individuals. He's definitely for the people. Obama is my boy, man. He, he just know what to do. Love Obama. Let's go. Time to party. Let's go. Uh, I can give you a hundred reasons. Give me, a, give me three. Three main reasons. First of all, Obama is ensuring that... Uh... And the American people have been complacent over the last several decades. They've enjoyed unparalleled prosperity. And let's face it, the average American on the street, he, he's not interested in what's happening in Kuwait. He could care less about Libya or something else. And so if you tell him, well, listen, we're bombing for democracy, goodness, freedom, human rights. So he says, okay, it doesn't affect him. He doesn't have to go. Children don't have to go. There doesn't appear to be any risk to him. Now that's changing. He's done everything Bush did, but more. Oh, I don't agree with that. Well, he had to continue what was started. You can't just say, okay, we're done. Well, sure, he didn't end the wars, but there are wars now, so we're in support of it. And, oh, well, sure, he hasn't completely pulled out of Iraq, but at least he's reducing the number of troops there. Oh, so it's, it's diet tyranny. It's tyranny light now. There's a lot of other reasons why I'm going to vote for Obama, and hearing that stuff honestly doesn't change it. For the greater good, most of the policies he's put in place, I agree. And he's challenging the status quo. Well, he is the status quo. <laughs> Obama's going to take us forward. The president and the first lady are kind of like the mom and the dad of the country. And when your dad says something, you listen. I pledge to be a servant to our president and all mankind. Because, because together, together we can, together, together we are, and together we people who have destroyed relationships with their families when they realize that their neocon uncle and their liberal cousin weren't just well-intentioned, that they were creating a justification for coercive government and ideology, that they were externalizing their own desires to control others, and that that was reflected in those relationships. It always is. I mean, no evil person or evil group of people are ever acknowledging that what they're doing is evil. I want nonviolence. Yes, I want so do I. Nonviolence. No, you don't. You're an Obama supporter. <laughs> do you think he wants to go kill people with drone strikes? Well, then That's what he wants to do? He orders it done, so I would assume All right, so. you're out of your mind. People are aware of the truth. People choose not to accept the truth. Uh, there's a difference with this. People who are completely unaware of the truth, those are becoming few. It's self-deception. How can you be honest in a political debate or any other contest? if you're deceiving yourself first. The people who will, you know, just do what the party wants and do what they're told and vote the way they're told and they just keep voting for the machine. After a certain point, there's no more deniability. They can't say, oh, I didn't know or, or I didn't understand. You can find people all over that will say that we should end the war, but they have a lot of trouble saying that when they meet a soldier. It was actually my older brother who talked me out of joining. We had a lot of conversations about the bravado of the current U.S. military forces, the 
the attitude if you ever go into the military. It's definitely about psychological conditioning. It's the idea that when life and death is on the line, you, you cannot afford to believe anything but the fact that you are the biggest, baddest force on the face of the earth. They say, you know, yeah, yeah, I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, because I'm the meanest motherfucker in the valley. Reloading! War is like a big video game that I can watch on my TV. And isn't it cool to see all the U.S. flags all over the foreign country, showing how the occupation is Means that you support everything the government wants. If you don't So we condition them and we convince them that their cause is just and that their enemy is subhuman and not worthy of living. And the American people honestly play a role in that. They come back and the reception they receive is just astounding. These brave soldiers have come from a combat zone defending our freedoms. Let's give them a round of applause. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't buy into that, really? Thank you for serving our country, and God bless you. USAA auto insurance is often handed down from generation to generation. I'm given tax breaks for being a veteran. I'm given discounts on my car insurance. I can go to the commissary, you know, tax-free groceries. I get all the benefits I could ever want in the military. Why would I question that? We have soldiers who are coming home they look at all this and they say, well, it seems like that was wrong, but how could I admit that that was wrong because that was a part of it? You'll never know what we go through for your freedoms, but at no point does anyone question how are they defending our freedoms by invading a foreign country? Well, you didn't serve, you don't know. Well, then what happens when a guy like Jesse Ventura, who not only served, but served in the SEALs, he comes out and he speaks and he says the same thing. Oh, he served, but. There is no but. He's served. He knows. He's been there. I was over in the Persian Gulf getting ready to liberate Kuwait, which is a kingdom, a dictatorship. And here I am liberating their oil assets from Iraq. I thought I was doing the right thing, too. And it's really hard to look back on that and say, hey, you know, that military conflict that I was in, that my friends died in, that I got shot at in, I have nightmares about, I guess that really should have never happened. And unfortunately, the media has worked tirelessly to ensure that this truth doesn't reach the American people. In the past, we had the media to watch the government and keep them in line and ask the tough questions. You all remember those clips in the old days, the black and white, and you'd see the news guys with the fedoras, yeah. They'd always go up and they'd be in people's face with the big flash bulbs, you know, Senator, Senator, this happened, this happened. You'd always hear, you know, politicians being held accountable and they're always being asked questions and you don't see that anymore. Leaders have found a way to call the masses into their own ideal sets. And whether that's through bread and circus, such as the Roman Empire, or today through the mainstream media, they get to decide that, yes, you're going to be obsessed with American Idol for over a decade, and when that starts to wane, you know, we'll come up with Dancing with the Stars, and let's really be concerned about who wins the Super Bowl. Three keys to power are banking, the media, and politics. If you own the banks, you can buy the media, you can buy the, the politicians. The if you own the media, you can control what people see, what people think, you can largely shape the culture, you can create and shape people's fears, people's desires, the perceptions that they have of events. In high definition. Here's Morgan, live. This is an ABC News. Watch me. Watch me. In 1975, there was a Senate investigation committee called the Church Hearings, which actually uncovered that the CIA was paying under the table mainstream media outlets 
$250 million a year to act as gatekeepers and propagandists. In today's terms, that's a billion dollars a year. Of course they say they don't do that anymore, but it's foolish to think that they don't. Why do you think the top story is the top story on all major networks? Carl Cameron, you know, he'll tell you straight up, I can't answer anything unless it comes from my editors. I can't unless I've got it approved from media relations. I, got I can only talk in front of my own camera. I'm sorry. All right, will you talk about Building 7? Talk about Building 7, help educate the public. If you get video of Sarah Palin or get a soundbite from her, bring that back to us. You can hold the Ron Paul stuff. <laughs> we single out something that the media likes to talk about, such as the Trayvon Martin Trayvon issue. Martin could have been me. But we don't talk about the much more serious events that are already well underway. When was the last time you saw images of, of caskets coming out of airplanes? You never do. So that's never in the mind frame. It's this happened now, Paris Hilton fucked somebody else. Well, let's spend two weeks on that. Can't say that this isn't newsworthy. Obviously, there is a blackout in effect. The mainstream media, though, wants to stay in business. And if they suddenly discover that the people listening to them don't want that message, they're not interested in listening to it, they'll change their tune. A lot of them are doing solid investigative journalism. Watergate. People were held accountable. People were fired. People were demoted. People were dealt with. There were, there were prison sentences handed out. At least there was the illusion of some kind of accountability back then. The Obama administration was caught red-handed supplying weapons to the Mexican cartel. Why? Because the CIA wants a certain cartel wiped out, protecting their own drug interests. What happened? Nothing. The American citizenry now, like you've said, Fast and the Furious, it's, they've done a great job. We just don't give a shit. First of all, I think that they shouldn't give us too much information because anything that you and I can watch on television, our enemies can watch. Really, it's better to not say too much. Don't worry about it. You know, go back to sleep. It's amazing. The, the mainstream media can actually do its job, and it doesn't matter. The American public is now in a state of apathy, almost a state of numbness. And that's what I see is like this is an entire country of people who are turning against the truth. But what are we developing the kids to do? We're developing them to not question authority. We're developing them to be entitled, that the government will take care of them from cradle to grave. You don't have parental rights anymore. Not just it takes a village to raise the child, but the village is now raising your child. When we condition the kids, what do we condition the kids to do? We always tell them, always share, always work in teams. See that table over there? We have six people sitting around. We always put four toys there. Not six, but four toys. Because these kids have to learn how to share. And that's a good lesson on some level. But what we don't teach the kids is that it's okay to keep the fruits of your labor. It's okay to work hard and earn and, and benefit from that. Jewel beat. The thing about wealth is wealth is not a zero-sum game. There is wealth out Jewel there for beat. everybody. All you have to do is be willing to work hard and earn it. The prevailing attitude in America today is almost that you should be ashamed to Jewel be successful. Beat. You should be ashamed to be rich. And that if you are rich, the assumption is that you got rich by taking from somebody else. You will not find your justice in capitalism. You will not find your justice in the colonial government of the United States. You will find justice when the institutions of capitalism and colonialism are destroyed and they are replaced by sustainable ways of being that nurture and protect all life. Mike, here with this uh, Occupy movement? Yeah. yeah. What are they doing? They're chilling.
hard bumps in life that want things to be free, more entitlements. What people are calling for in Occupy Wall Street is like, well, God damn it, government, you need to do something. This is why we're losing all of our rights to too many people that are being dependent upon the system. We want to get all the free stuff. Where is my free stuff at? Nobody wants to hear this, do they? Getting my school loans paid for, getting my rent paid for, my food paid for. It needs to be what we can do for ourselves. I will put this damn mic down once you all turn our country into a socialist society and you take away my right to speak. Choose to be complacent or ignorant, and that's fine. That's your right, too. This is how you disperse a protest movement. We have to ask a couple of basic questions. The first basic question, what should the role of government be? Should the role of government be there to run the entitlement system? Should we believe this, this story that entitlements are rights? Yes, there's always an appetite for big government. There's always this temptation of getting something for free. And there's always the motivation, well, we'll help the poor people. You want to give free food, free medical care, free education, free houses, and everything will be okay. The law at the core of collectivism is that it is all for the good of the collective. Once they get you to swallow that lie, any other lie they tell in service of that is not a lie. It, Orwell nailed it, you know, freedom is slavery. And a lot of the people out there in activism are embracing big government. They think that big government should be used for our benefit, that they can use it for a benefit. And the argument being, again, that you can't. That kind of control of central power, that's it's too much control for any one group. I don't think the government should give you something for free. Where does the government get it? They never produce a thing. The only thing the government can do is steal it from a productive individual. You don't have a right to your neighbor's wealth. You can't go in and steal from your neighbor. But you shouldn't have the right to send a call a politician or a congressman to go into your neighbor's house and take what they have because you want it. They're saying that if you have more personal wealth than we think is necessary, then we're going to take some of that from you and we're going to give it to people that don't have any personal wealth. I'm a warrior for the middle class. I mean, I, I do think at a certain point you've made enough money. But those who grab the moral high ground and say that we're going to take care of the poor, what do they do? Welfareism and inflationism and socialism, they produce the poor. It's not in the best interest of the people that run welfare programs to get people off welfare. Their funding is based on the number of clients that they have. Well, if they get a client off welfare, they get a client a job, then they lose that client, they lose that client's money. Because you've got to remember, it's a skimming game. For every dollar that it goes to a person on welfare, $10 is used to support that system. All these entitlement programs, they'll go on forever if you let them, because they will encourage people to become entitled. Well, I can work for minimum wage, or I can just quit my job and go on welfare if I have kids. Welfare is a better deal, because I still get the money and I don't have to work. War on poverty, are you kidding me? 47 years ago, and now we have 47 million Americans on food stamps in this country. So for 47 years we fought this war, bankrupted ourselves, and now what? We have cultivated this large underclass that has made itself dependent upon government, and government has encouraged that. The ruling elite love to create a nanny state because then you'll go along with their plan. You're not going to bite the hand that feeds you. And then the people who are getting the entitlement, well, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to vote for the people that continue the entitlement. We're saying to these people, well, you can't support yourself, so we'll just support you. But no, you got to support us when the time comes. We have historically been a bottom-up society. We're not a top-down society. You can't make someone equal economically to someone else by giving them something. Are you going to hear Mr. Obama talk in those terms? No, Mr. Obama says everyone gets everything for nothing in perpetuity. Don't worry, we'll print money. Don't worry, we'll do whatever is required. You can all be permanently dependent upon us, and that's a good thing. Honestly, it's, it's almost like slavery. There's no personal freedom without economic freedom. If you don't have the means to earn money to support yourself, then you're going to be dependent on the government for food, for clothing, for shelter, for everything you need to stay alive. Because after all, look up the definition of the dictionary of slavery. It's ultimately boiled down to one word, dependence. 
If you are dependent upon anything other than yourself to provide for yourself, you are a slave. I won't have to worry about putting gas in my car. I won't have to worry about paying my mortgage. You know, if I, if I help him, he's gonna help me. The idea of self-reliance is gone. The idea of independence and individual freedom the respect for private property, all of these things is gone. No, 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 no. We can confiscate wealth from people that create it and give it to those who have none, and that will fix things. We've transferred 16 trillion in wealth since 1965 to the so-called underclass. The only thing the underclass has done is get bigger. They want that cradle-to-grave care from the government, and they want the government to use force and violence against people who are opposed to it. Well, I obviously believe that my ideas are persuasive enough and beneficial enough to society that people should subscribe to them, but frankly, some people don't, and yes. And at the end of the day, you will use force against those people? I believe that it's the role of the government to use force. So you won't do it yourself, you'll hire someone else to do it, basically? That's what a government is. The reasons people do violence, if you look at the psychological underpinning, it's fear, insecurity, and the desire to survive. So we turn to violence when we're not secure in those things, when we're not secure in our own sense of selves, and our own ability to thrive. That's why government propaganda is always fear-based. It's difficult for me to think that if we lose our economic freedoms, we become dependent on the government for our, our basic needs, the next step is we lose our personal freedoms because then starvation becomes a weapon. Now, if the, if the food stops, if the free services stop, and I think that could easily happen because I, I think this whole giant federal edifice could go under, then you're going to have problems in many of these urban areas. In fact, you've already got them in the form of these flash mobs. We see gang members who are committing welfare fraud, and they are killing middle class people who work for a living and pay taxes. You know, these folks, they're not going to support this, this welfare state, but the people who do support the welfare state, well, they're going to go off and kill their political opponents. We're, we're already seeing this. This has already begun. It's just not covered in the media. We don't talk about it. We need an example, a beautiful example, of minimal power in our government, and then we had maximum productivity and maximum wealth. But today we think too much of the wealth and believe that government provides this rather than understanding that wealth and prosperity comes from freedom and productivity and not from the government. When we had a freer market and sounder money and limited government, the middle class in this country was the largest middle class in the history of the world and it was the wealthiest middle class in the world. Madison said it very well. The purpose of government is to protect the unequal distribution of wealth. Mr. Obama wants to destroy that unequal distribution, forcibly. Personal responsibility, self-sufficiency, independence, all these things, you can't have that without recognized individualism. Individualism is now being demonized. You're selfish if you're an individual. You need to be thinking about the whole, the needs of the whole. Well, of course we do, we all do. And we discussed 250 plus years ago that the best way to go about this is by securing individual rights. But you can use the needs of the whole as justification for all manner of tyranny. If you're looking for a leader, you're going to get a master and you fucking deserve one. The most ancient divide in politics remains to this day the fundamental divide. The legalists, as they were called, and they were chiefly the people in the governing class, just as they are today. And we would call them totalitarian who believe that every aspect of our lives should be dictated and ruled and pushed around by government. Instead of a political continuum being a line from left to right, it was really a circle. And that all political systems had to be judged by the amount of bodies that they stacked up. At the bottom of the circle, cheek by jowl, was communism, Nazism. Moving up the scale, you had socialism, fascism, all of the various collectivisms is subordinate the individual. And at the top was the Constitutional Republic of the United States. Free man, free markets, rule of law, ordered liberty. What the Chinese used to call the Confucians, the libertarians, the live and let live again, the free marketeers, the small government men, the small tax. Us. This is a country of individuals. 
what sets us apart from Western Europe around the time of the founding of this nation is that you already had socialism already in Europe. It just had different names. You know, whether you call it socialism, communism, monarchy, the end result is the same. A small oligarchy of people are in control. 90 plus percent of the masses are out of control. Our country is hijacked by a bunch of cretins and draconian legislatures who have grown complacent and comfortable as they receive from us the best health care in the world for free, six-figure salaries, the best business connections that corruption can buy. I mean, our government's supposed to be, well, first of all, transparent, but also should be doing our will. They're just our representatives. They don't respect the Constitution, nor do they respect the will of the people, nor do they respect you know, the principle of the, pe the sovereigns knowing what they're doing. So they presume that they're, that they're somehow you know, the appointed elite. They believe they were born with spurs on their feet and the rest of us were born with saddles on our backs and ridden. This is the attitude they have. It's, it's really kind of modern royalty. It's perfectly expressed in, you know, we are the board, you will surrender to us. They presume up front that they have the right to direct you because of this larger idea that, oh, by the way, only serves their interest. That's the big lie of collectivism because it isn't even about collective. It's about personal power of the people who direct the collective. They hate the idea that ordinary smelly people should be allowed to have a say when government should, in their view, be in the hands of the great and the good who deserve to be deserved. A new aristocracy of blackguards. We talk about the conditioning of our kids and the conditioning of our military and our police and we talk about the political conditioning that people are undergoing. What we're really talking about is a social movement and what we're talking about is changing the way people think in terms of what it means to be free and what it means to be a person. The Declaration of Independence said that we hold these truths to be self-evident. What the Founding Fathers were saying there was this is obviously the way it is. There's no question that all men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. What they're saying there is that plain and simple, by the nature of being a human being, you simply are allowed to be free, to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That might be one of the reasons the Constitution's not taught in our public schools because if we raise up a new generation of individuals, they might realize that this whole system of government is unconstitutional. We shouldn't have it. This document is the only thing that's going to save us, and if Barack Obama refuses to follow it, as he has demonstrated time and time again, nothing's going to change, folks. If you get enough generations that come up under this system, and they just keep injecting more and more and more of the tired old world saga of collectivism into the minds of the youth, then this is where you end up. What? Capitalism, people prosper. Socialism, people die. Millions. No, 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 no. You know, lady, I was born in USSR. I lived there for 29 years. Really? Millions of people dead, and this is one of the mass murderers. Murdering people left and right. You didn't do this. Really? You don't think you're so? You're in exile. Really? Okay, you're one of the rich people luck. they threw good. out of the country because you were robbing the people. Everybody was equal. That's true. Everybody was equally miserable Maybe and so, poor. Yeah. If you live under a dictatorship, a communistic dictatorship, of course you're not going to love it. You know, nobody loves it. They didn't let people leave. Right, yeah. They killed people. They, they literally shot and killed people who tried to leave Poland. They used to give you cards, like stamps, like food stamps. And you used to go in the store and you, you, had no, you had no choice of what to buy. And they always tell me, you know, you're spoiled. You get all these gifts for Christmas. Right. For Christmas, we got meat. They would grow wheat, they'd grow corn, and then they would turn it all into the collective and they expected to get something back. Well, the quotas were too high, they didn't get anything back. So you literally had people growing their own food, turning over to the government, and then starving to death. You have rationing of food in any controlled economy. They reduced the people to utter dependency and that's how the Soviet Union had their way with people for decades. And people died, you know. Thousands of people died. Well, my dad, like, put his whole life on the line to come here because he saw it as a beacon of freedom. He saw it the complete opposite of what he was living under in Poland. That was his major goal, is to get away where I could have an opportunity 
to live my life in freedom and not be ruled by, you know, the elites. I grew disaffected from communism, first because of the revelations of the killing fields in, in Southeast Asia. I had cheered when Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos fell. Then the revelations started coming out about massacres of innocents. This is evil. This is evil as the Nazis. Nazi, 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 Nazi. It's really hard for people to fathom those numbers when you're talking about Stalin, 60 million, uh, Mao, you're talking, for what, 40 million, you're talking about Hitler, 6 million. The individual matters Jeez. not a thing. That's why they define peace as the silence, imprisonment, or death of their enemies. Jeez. To believe anything else is to deny a reading of human history. Jeez. After the revolution, Jeez. all these guys who helped the revolution wound up being victims of Stalin. And because, because they, they had torn down the, any protections of the individual, right? they were gone. So if you're a hard right-winger, if you're a hard left-winger, if you've participated in the Degelian dialectic, you've served your purpose. You're what they call the useful idiot. They don't care about you once you have fulfilled your role for them. The government doesn't quite frankly care if the terrorists attack, like embassies or servicemen, okay? That's part of the job. That's what they signed up for, is to take risks. The soldiers are, for all intents and purposes, U.S. government property. And that's where the term GI comes from. GI stands for government issue. And when Henry Kissinger said military men are like dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns in our foreign policy, I kind of summed it up. What difference at this point does it make? I think of the story of the early days of World War I on Christmas Eve when they took a pause and the Germans and the British started singing Christmas carols and they finally got together and exchanged gifts and had a Christmas tree. And then in a day or two later, the hard might of the government comes in and says, you will not have peace. You must go back to shooting and killing each other again. White Eisenhower in his farewell address from the presidency said that we should beware of the military industrial complex. It is fully metastasized today into a cancer on our society that takes the best and brightest and the most nobly intent who would put their lives on the line to defend fellow Americans and puts them into these bullshit wars that have nothing to do with national defense. And we've paid a terrible price for it. What, 1.4 trillion is a minimum? That doesn't even begin to address the massive consequences of the damage we've done to ourselves. It doesn't talk about the enormous losses we've inflicted on the people in the region because remember, no one cares how many people we've killed or maimed or, or wounded. We've lost close to 9,000 Americans in this period of time, 44,000 severe injuries. We have hundreds of thousands of veterans today begging and pleading for help. You see, Osama bin Laden killed you know, thousands of people on 9-11, and he has paid for that. He's dead. His organization is scattered to the four winds, but we're still in Afghanistan. First, it was linked to uh, weapons of mass destruction, and then linked to Al-Qaeda, and he helped fund the, the terrorists of 9-11. So that's justifying killing a million civilians to where parts of Iraq you can't even live in? And while this is all going on, we're conditioning them that this is right. We're conditioning them that this is what they have to do, that their cause is just. As a result of this work, the world is more stable than it was five years ago. Apparently it's morally okay to launch a war on the most absurd, transparent pretext, kill maybe a million people, displace four million people, and this is mainstream. That's a mainstream position. People forget that when you hear these numbers, you can't possibly conceive that millions have been killed in the war in Iraq, for example, because we're such a compassionate military force. People forgetting that the statistics don't always account for the, the birth defects and miscarriages. Depleted uranium is essentially an industrial waste byproduct, and what better way to make money of something you don't have to worry about spending money on disposing of safely, right, than to turn it into a weapon. This is a very dense material, a very dense compound, great for anti-armor. The problem is it leaves 
thousands of years worth of radioactivity behind. And if you look at children that are being born in Iraqi Kurdistan in particular, they use a lot of depleted uranium, but they're using a lot everywhere anyway. You've got massive deformities, gigantism and other things. Higher rates of cancer, leukemia, and infant mortality were found here than in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These babies are doomed to die. These are untold thousands, if not millions of lives that are being killed even before they're born. Those are the true costs of modern warfare. Depleted uranium is also a violation of the Geneva Convention and various other treaties that have been agreed upon by the United States and other Western powers with respect to chemical and biological weapons. Hell, we're in Iraq for WMDs and we're using WMDs against these people. You don't hear about our weapons of mass destruction, do you? You know who pays for that? You do. Your taxpayer dollars. You're the one who pays for that, so I hope you feel good about that. Dear any American who thinks this Boston massacre is a big deal, but never protested a war, go fuck yourself. In Iraq, from the end of the first Gulf War to the start of the current occupation in 2003, sanctions on the country led to the deaths, conservatively estimated, of half a million Iraqi children. That's like 45 Boston massacres per day in Iraq for a decade, one every half hour. And they're not being blown up in explosions. No, these are the ones dying slowly, painfully, starving to death. Did you cry over that? Did you protest? Did you do anything to voice any opposition to what Madeleine Albright, then Secretary of State, called acceptable collateral damage? You can't say that you are a Christian, that you believe in the sanctity of all life, and go bombing people into the Stone Age and taking their shit. That's immoral. You can't have it both ways and then say, oh, but I'm going to oppose abortion. You either are or you are not. I can respect someone a whole lot more like a Zygmunt Brzezinski or Henry Kissinger who just outright says it. Just outright says, we're going to take it because we fucking can't. And if you oppose that, try and stop us. At least we know where they stand. But with the common American, you want to have it both ways. We are dropping bombs on crowded cities at night where old people and children are sleeping. And we're watching it on CNN. doing with all these wars? How are we safer? This is a product of the emotionally stunted state that Americans have been lulled into. To be told when to cry, when to care, when to mourn, when to shut up and go along with the plan and keep paying your taxes. We are creating enemies with this foreign policy faster than we can kill them. And I can tell you that from my personal experience in Fallujah that backs that assertion up. They don't hate us because we're free. They hate us because we're myopic, patriotic idiots who allow ourselves to be so emotionally manipulated that when something like this happens, the result is more brown people on the other side of the planet die. We made good progress and we'll continue to work together to achieve freedom and peace. People don't care because they choose not to. It's that simple. Either you do care, or you don't fucking care. To look at those people as inferior people, for God's sakes. Because that's them, it's not we, it's them. But them and we belong to the same people. That is the human freaking race here. I have heard more times out of people, well, you know what, it doesn't affect me directly. So I don't fucking care. And they'll, they'll go, is that wrong? If you consider yourself to be a moral person, you have to be opposed to this. If you do not care about morality, well, at least you're being honest, but I think we've got a nation, an entire nation of sheep doing everything they can to avoid that level of moral responsibility. Now, Mr. McGovern, what is your problem? I'm, I'm sorry. He says, look, he says, uh, don't you think it's worth uh, three or four killed to, get, to secure the oil supplies that we need? I 
said, well, uh, suppose one of those four killed this week was your son. He said, it wouldn't be my son. <laughs> and it wouldn't be his son. Our enemies are not 7,000 miles from home. They sit in boardrooms. They are the millionaires and billionaires who control this planet, and we've had enough of them. The state has us thinking that it is us. Should we invade Iran? Or should we starve them? How dare they say we? It's them. Human yeah. beings die. They don't need to die. Fuck them and give them a chance. We're an incredibly gifted, creative race. Just not given the opportunity because we've been suppressed through tyranny. I will not be a part of that anymore. These medals don't mean anything to me, and they can have them back. And I choose human life over war, militarism, and imperialism. You are deluded, and your delusion is dangerous, and it is getting people killed. And your attitude, your tribalism, your personal identity, because you choose you want to be an American before you want to be a human being, it's disgusting. Sorry to all of you. Fucking sorry. Yeah, you're right. I didn't serve. You're the one serving. And it's your children who are going to look up to you and think that you're the greatest people in the whole world. Do you want a better life for your children or do you want perpetual warfare? I really see this as sort of a moral decline of the United States of America, the idea that the ends justify the means. We need your oil so we have every right to take it because we're bigger and stronger than we ever fucking do. This is the stuff that keeps me up at night. This is the stuff that uh, keeps me up at night. So you've got the media propaganda arm, which keeps us loving our own slavery. Then you've got the financial system, which keeps us dependent on them. Then you've got the military state, the police state, to keep physical control over us. The function of the police used to be simply to protect basic rights and they've shifted over the decades from that to revenue generation. They're pulling you over and they're giving you tickets for not the breaking of laws, but statute infractions. Thank you for swearing to the oath of the Constitution, sir, but this is a statute violation, which is an Admiral Maritime Law. But, which is, <laughs> Say that again? <laughs> Admiral Maritime Law, right? Which is like a sea-bound ordinance. Basically, when you see the gold feathers on the flag, it means you're stepping into a courtroom that's run by Admiral Maritime Law which is in violation of the common law, which is the constitutional law. By entering into that courtroom, you're agreeing to go before a uh, banker instead of a judge, so that way they levy fines and judgments against you. I am the judge of the law. I will instruct the jury on what the law is. I object. You That's are fine, not sir. a judge. You are an executive administrator. Okay. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled there are no judicial courts in America. There has not been since 1789. So judges do not enforce statutes and codes. Executive administrators enforce statutes and codes. All right, we're done. Statutes are just basically designed as hidden taxes on the public. It's just a way to generate revenue. So it, we've already set that precedent. It's gotten the police able to accept the fact that they are basically revenue generators and not law enforcement officials. I remember what I said before about government programs, the welfare programs, are not designed to get people off welfare. They're designed to keep people on welfare and recruit new people to be on welfare. Well, internment programs are not designed to keep people from being interred. 2.2 million people in prison. They say this is the most free country in the world. All it comes down to if we want to intern someone is just making a rule, a law, that they violate well, punishable by internment. The government doesn't have any control over law-abiding people. Any force used against those people is not legitimate because they're not doing anything wrong. 
But if you make enough things illegal and you make the law difficult to comply with, then you get to the point where you can create criminals. And when you create criminals, then you create a class of people that are open to oppression. Martha Stewart, her uh, stock trading was ruled by the court to be a legal act. But they sent her to prison anyway because she lied about it. I mean, she went to prison because she said she didn't commit a crime. But that's federal law. That's what we created. Can you tell me one thing that you're free to do without asking permission or paying to get a license, registration, or permit? Hang out with my friends and have a great time. Yeah. Hey, could you tell me what you're free to do in America? Everything. I can eat however many carbs a day I want. But in New York City, they're trying to make all kinds of laws to ban salt and uh, drinks that are a certain size. So, I mean, I that's good because a lot of people are obese. We got pages and pages and pages of arbitrary laws. Two thirds of our prison industrial complex is filled with nonviolent, small time drug possession offenders. Law enforcement agencies get money to fund drug operations. Well, if they don't have any drug operations, they're not going to get any of that funding. And the amount of funding they get is contingent on the number of drug busts that they make. So what's the incentive there? Is it to reduce drugs in their community? Absolutely not. The incentive is to increase the amount of drug busts they get and push their stats up and then get more funding. Thousands of police officers out there have been convinced that marijuana is the most insidious, horrible drug on the planet. People are using it. Doctors are prescribing it. And yet our federal government still maintains that it's somehow an insidious, dangerous substance that people need to go to prison for 100 years if they're caught with a certain amount of it. They're arresting someone with an ounce of marijuana in their pocket and sending them to prison for five years and saying, there's nothing wrong with this because they told me that this drug is a threat to my way of life. We've created a class of citizen that can be interred in this country. Any one of us could wind up being moved into that little box based on some new law. There are so many laws that the average American commits three felonies a day, and they can arrest you at any time they feel like it. And a cop can pull you over at any point you're on a public street and find something wrong with your vehicle and give you a ticket for it and steal some of your income. And if you look at him crossways, he can put you in jail. And if you, if you don't look at him crossways, he can say that you did and put you in jail. That's the kind of arbitrary authority that exists in the police state in America today. Who are you and what are you doing? Let me see some ID, please. The liberty doesn't come from our government. Sometimes they think they're passing it out and sometimes they are always restricting as if it's their liberty rather than our liberty. They say that about the law and pass all these unconstitutional laws making us slaves. The question is, when government becomes feeble and oppressive, to whom can the people turn for peace, safety, and freedom? Your sheriff's main responsibility is to protect you from the federal government. And then we give our police departments military-grade weaponry, assault rifles, we give them armored vehicles, Jeez. helicopters, infrared. This is what we woke up to this morning. Men with machine guns coming towards Jeez. us. We see a giant arms race against the American people, but not just here in the United States. Worldwide, governments Jeez. are massively increasing their spending for domestic control with a standardized police state that they've developed in third world countries that they've invaded and taken over. On your window, go back inside your house. State police forces that gush at the thought of cooperating with Homeland Security and the feds, completely turning the whole concept of our government on its head by saying that 
the federal government is here to protect us when really the founding fathers designed the government to protect us from, from growth of government. I think militarization is a better term than federalization to describe what is happening to the police force. It just so happens that under the current system of government, it's happening at an increasingly federal level that the federal government takes control over local police forces while at the same time using the federal government's revenue generation system of printing money or through direct taxation to funnel more money to support things that the free market never would to continue the racket that is government. Ronald Reagan said the closest thing to eternal life is a government agency and it's true because once you give them the funding to do things with at best a warped system of accountability they're going to take that power and trust it in them to keep their own paychecks going, not by serving people, but by serving that twisted system of approval for that funding. Jewel Beat. Jewel Beat. Work for the Federal Reserve? Yep. What's the Federal Reserve Bank around here? It's not. It's not? Nope. TSA agents are on the interstates fighting terrorism with visible intermodal prevention and response, or VIPER operations. Vicki, you know, this was a massive operation really bringing all federal, state, and local agencies together to not only do random searches, but also create an army of agents on wheels. It's all, in a way, starting to blur together. You can see examples of the gray state in our modern time just by simply walking down the street and looking at authority figures that you have to deal with. You can see that uh, a lot of authorities are becoming more militarized just by in the way they look, in the way they act, and uh, the way that they uh, treat us. If you have an honorable discharge from the military, it's pretty easy to get a job in any police force in America. We see people coming home for more taking those jobs and bringing that mentality of the military occupation to domestic law enforcement. And so that does have an actual effect on the relationship between individual officers and citizen subjects. I was up uh, confronting Carl Rove on war crimes with Colleen Rowley and others. The police escort that he had with his entourage was younger guys, cut, very fit, you know, we all like to joke about the donut eating cop who's overweight and couldn't run a mile to save his life. These guys are, these guys are cut. And the look in his eye when I was disobeying him, he wanted to hurt me. He wanted to hurt me. I even called him out on it and I said, you want to hurt me right now, don't you? You really did, let me guess, you were over in Iraq, weren't you? And he says, we need to leave. We need you to leave right now. I'm like, well, isn't that a bitch? Because I bought a copy of Carl Rove's book here, so I'm a customer. I'm not loitering, am I? This guy, he wanted to hurt you. If he had been given the order by his higher ups to beat this living piss out of me, he would have not hesitated. So you have a lot of guys coming out of that mentality of the dehumanization of the enemy that is how we impose martial law in Iraq and Afghanistan and applying that in the United States. We see this militarization of the law enforcement and we combine that with the conditioning that we do. They're not even people, they're bad guys, they're criminals, they're enemy, they're drug users. So these people are inherently evil, and we are absolutely good, and we have the best high-tech equipment and weapons, and we are going to squash this enemy. It goes back to the ego again and the badass mentality, and then the police want that, because yeah, they don't want people questioning what they're doing. They want people who get off on power. Shut your mouth, I'm talking! I am Officer Rivieri. Now, the sooner you learn that, the longer you're going to live in this world. There is a intentional dumbing down of Americans. You all realize that. And that starts in public school. The cops in the military went to the same public school you and I did. And they didn't learn their history, didn't learn their heritage, they didn't learn the Constitution. But they're not all bad. Most of them, I'm sure, joined the police and military because in their hearts, they saw themselves as a hero. And they wanted to be a hero, and they wanted to be a, a defender and a guardian. And so the best of motives, but if they don't know the Constitution, and they don't understand the basic principles about human rights, 
they can be easily manipulated and twisted into becoming dissonant forces. I often talk about how things seem to be going in cycles and how history repeats itself and how like we have the Occupy movement is the Hooverville of today. With the Occupy movement, we saw militarized police uh, using weapons used in uh, foreign wars against protesters domestically. These Occupy Wall Street people are dissenting and we need to crush them. Don't 16, skirmish line, huh? And you saw rows and rows and rows of militarized police, and they assemble and put their shields together and start beating their shields. Thump, thump, thump. It's psychological. It's designed to intimidate and create fear. I was just pleading the cops, please don't tear gas us. We're completely peaceful. No one's facilitating any aggression, and they just like tear gas all of us. Kids in strollers were in their mom, and people were actually trampling each other to try to get out. I've had conversations with police officers before and asked them about what's going on with uh, Occupy Wall Street. Like, is this right? You know what most of them say? No, that's not right. They can't do that. I'm like, so why are they doing that then? Why are they getting away with it? It doesn't only apply to Occupy, of course. It's a pattern of police brutality that goes completely unaccounted for. When she had someone call the Stark County Sheriff, her troubles got worse. You're just walking and all of a sudden... <laughs> Without a warrant, commandeered my vehicle, searched and seized my home. Both of them bust out of the car with the guns drawn. Get on the fucking ground, let me see your fucking hands, don't fucking move. Hands off! Hands! Fucking hands! At least eight officers rushed to the car with guns drawn and even rifles out. Then one fatal shot was fired. Sticking their middle finger at us and screaming obscenities, telling us your friend shot himself. I have no criminal background, I have no psychiatric past. <laughs> They have the surgery. I'm holding my dick in my hands. Are you going to stick your hand on their pants or something? Yep. What's my arm? What's my arm? They started shooting him. Controversial police shooting in Anaheim. They just released the dog and I had my baby. <laughs> they smashed my face into the drywall and asked if I was going to cooperate. If I refuse, that makes me guilty right away. I complied under duress. Stop resisting! Stop resisting! I had no witnesses. If I had resisted, I would have been busted up. Could have been in the morgue. He saw a police officer shoot Patricia Cook to death in this church parking lot. Stepped out in the street and fired five more times. I wish I knew what the hell was going on. The American people refuse to be terrorized, except by our own fucking government. As an American, you are eight times more likely to be killed by a cop than by a terrorist. I would rather go to jail than be dead. Corruption has always been there. You don't question it because the higher up you go within the police realms, it's kind of like the mafia. Oh, they'll take care of you. You know, you never narc on a fellow officer. No charges have been filed. There was no jury. A judge was the sole decider. He says police videos like these should be used to protect police, not go after them. There wasn't going to be any investigation at that point. <laughs> When we hear about someone challenging a police officer's authority to search them, they're often dismissed as a kook. You know better than that. I'm sure you do too. I know exactly how it works, and you know I know that. Yeah, I've dealt with you many times. No, you haven't dealt with me. I'm with Cop Watch. I've dealt with you. Well, the fact is you have the right to challenge that authority to search. You have that right. But now you have state patrol and police officers saying, you don't have any rights. You can't question my authority. I told you to stop. Chicken in the window, you hear me?
we've had police and law enforcement we talk to and we confront them with facts about what's going on they say I don't know and I don't care I think we're at a point with the economy where they don't give a shit I don't think they're trying to justify it morally they truly don't give a shit it's the idea that I have to do this it's orders and if I don't my pension's gone and my career is over your livelihood the economy and I can stand up for that, but then how am I going to provide for my kids? It's pretty easy to abandon the rule of law when you're following the rule of number one, which is take care of your, you and yours. I think that's the modus operandi of most police. And then you have the truly sadistic 10% of them who just simply get off on it. Not only do they just not care, but they, they revel in it. It's the idea that, you know, it feels good to be dressed up like this. You know, it feels good to have power over other people. There are, yes, six police officers and individuals within government who get off on exerting authority unjustly and get off on violating your rights. But that's not the driving factor. That's a consequence of the scam that is government and of the status paradigm. So I see that all over the country now. I see the police increasingly becoming militarized, very, very aggressive, and the idea of constitutional rights is laughable to them. I never got it. No, shut up! No, I'm not shutting up! You cannot shut me up! I know my rights! I don't give a shit! Okay. It's the First Amendment issue. I can take pictures. It doesn't matter. You get off my property. I need to see your ID. This is a police state! Get that kid this is a police state! Greg Steffi and his wife Hope are accusing deputies of using excessive and outrageous force, an allegation the sheriff denies. It's just wrong that they do this to people. She called for help. She asked them for help, not for this. There are cops out there that are justifying it to themselves every day. Well, unfortunately, I mean, we've seen a lot of people just mindlessly following orders already. It's just amazing, this divide between cops and, and citizens and activists. And it's sad. It's sad that the fight has, has gone between, you know, who we're really trying to fight is the power elite that are creating these policies, and they've made it against cops versus us, and that's really, you know, cops are part of us. They just don't realize that, that this is happening. It's not necessarily the police that are our enemies here. It is the people that are controlling them. It's the people behind the scenes that are making them do these outrageous things to us on a daily basis. All these things are being used, and they're being justified by this war on terror, this war on drugs. And the question is, why does the federal government feel like the solution to these problems is to declare war on us? We will again set an example for the world that the law is not subject to the whims of stubborn rulers and that justice is not arbitrary. Shortly after 9-11, within a week or two, there was a bill brought to the floor that had been floating around the Congress for several years, but it never had enough support and they couldn't get it passed. But on after 9-11, they said, now is the time that we'll pass this wonderful bill that's going to protect the people, the Patriot Act. But if they had called that a repeal the Fourth Amendment Act, maybe it wouldn't have passed so easily. There are no shortcuts to protecting America. I will provide our intelligence and law enforcement agencies with the tools they need to track and take out the terrorists without undermining our Constitution and our freedom. The US is funneling money into tracking systems that are threatening to make the very concept of privacy a thing of the past. In the past five years, the Department of Defense has shelled out an estimated $3 billion on biometric programs, technology that uses physiological and behavioral recognition to identify people. However, the top cash cow is expected to remain government spending on security. It's always the government that says, oh, if you don't have anything to hide, why are you worried about the Patriot Act? Why are you worried about all these spy systems and data mining? But yet it's those same people that hide in private, that meet in secret, under armed guards, that won't disclose what they're doing, but they want to see, hear what we're doing. New televisions have cameras and microphones built in them, facial recognition scanners, audio voice recognition. So that is an open video camera and an open mic in your living room, in your bedroom, that any sophisticated hacker or the government could and do tap into at any time. In New York City, they're implementing iris scanners. It's actually an app for the iPhone. Long-range fingerprint and iris scanning are reportedly also being explored for the U.S. toolbox of tracking. However, scientists are reportedly developing new technology aimed at identifying anyone from much greater distances. We are five years away in New York from zero privacy. They're trying to push through 
Being able to take our blood now too. Treat it like you're in a, a maximum security prison. People thought that drones were just in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Now they're in America. Now they're arming them. Now they're putting facial recognition scanners on the drones. The NYPD is mounting body scanners like in the airports to the back of patrol cars and they're going to be scanning people as they drive up and down the streets. So the Supreme Court has already ruled that the NYPD wasn't allowed to use infrared technology to do the same thing. So now they're just trying a different flavor of radiation. When I worked in the agency, this was the day before, gigantic amounts of computerization. Everyone had a 201 file. Everything we knew about a target would include any comments that people had made about you, anything we'd overheard about you, five or six files, each two or three inches thick. The amount of effort it took to go through something like that in paper format meant a good deal of the 20,000 employees in the CIA spent their time doing just that. In today's digital age, when you can go online and get 90% of a person's history just from open source, your life is not your own as far as the government goes. You can't have 100% security and also then have 100% privacy. We're, we're going to have to make some choices. We see the globalists building a giant police state control grid and calling themselves technocrats. A technocrat is a group of dictators who use technology to control people. They can tap your phone, uh, record conversations, go into your email, and they do on a daily basis. They just don't tell you because they don't have to. There can be warrantless wiretaps and warrantless searches on your digital information. There's stuff out there that will suck your hard drive and 10 seconds or less, it's no big deal. A system touted as a national security necessity is being used to build a database where the biometric identity of millions of Americans will be gathered and stored. It is of no dispute that who you're calling, when, how long you're talking, what you're buying, all the stuff that happens on your iPhone or smart device is being used. Now at the time, there's no legal oversight as to what these fusion centers, as they're called, there's no oversight as to how they're gonna use it, but it's there. So they're fusing databases, which is the concept of a fusion center, from driver's license, criminal databases, social networking, they've added to that now. The CIA could care less about all these social media because it's not sort of objective reporting on people, but the people who really care about that are commercial entities, and they're leading the way on the science of extracting all this information and coming up with algorithms to explain this person believes this, this person believes that. Computer algorithms that they're using can track most people's habits and what they're going to do within a 94% accuracy rate. Google boasts about that. Of course now the CIA has noticed that, all right, and all they simply have to do is buy a commercial off-the-shelf product to find the people they really want to find. So if I use my iPhone to purchase a product, you know, it's flagged, it's under suspicion, I'm going on a list that will be, you know, tucked away for a later time. That means that people can collect it and then look at when they want to. And they may only want to when all of a sudden you say, hey, I object to this. And they go, oh, well, let's take a look and see what would make you object to that. Let's see why you don't like what we're doing to you. You haven't committed a crime yet, but the second that spectrum of crime shifts over to include whatever it is you are doing, they do know where you are. If you become a political enemy to somebody, or you have an ideology that people don't like, look, right now there's a war on raw milk in this country. So if I drink raw milk, then I'm going to become an enemy of some industry, the FDA or the USDA, and now I can be targeted politically. It's happened, people being targeted by the police state because of their political affiliations, people's children being taken away from them because they're critical of the government. If I go and, and try to find out something about you, and I have to do extraneous measures to do that, there should be no objection from you because if you're not doing anything wrong, what have you got to hide? But it's very hard to explain to people who don't get it because it's, it's, for them it's normal. They think it's just being open and they live in a world of reality shows. They want their every little thought to be communicated. That's not an Orwellian dystopia, it's, it's a brave new world dystopia. It's a nightmare but they don't know it, they're happy. So that, that's the worst of all really. Like me? Yeah, like what? Everything. Like what? Well, do you ever deposit or withdraw more than $1,000 in your bank account? Yeah. Okay, definitely. well, you're on, you're get, you get reported to the freaking Department of Homeland yeah. Security every so time you what? do that. So what? Why should I worry about it? I'm a Verizon uh, uh, customer. I don't mind uh, Verizon turning over records 
to the government. I don't think you're talking to terrorists. I know you're not. I'm no, I know I'm not, so we don't have anything to worry about. Get an iPhone and you're good for life. For them, it's logical. If they want to see me going to the football game, fine. I don't care. But actually, they are slightly modifying their behavior, and they're less free as a result. The chilling effect is very strong because when you are telling people that they're being spied on, I mean, the drones, for instance, this new element of drone surveillance, a lot of people say that they're just like, well, I have nothing to hide, so why should I care? That's not the point. The point is that when you have a tape recorder out on a table, you're not going to say the same things that you would before. You're not going to dissent as much. And that's the real suppression. I'm worried that the new generation doesn't understand what privacy is because they've never had it and because everything is about sharing. And I mean, we probably are the last generation who knew what it was like to be unmonitored. Therefore, we know what we're losing, but they'll never know. So the question is, why don't you trust us? And I tell people, because I've been one of the people who are supposed to protect America. I'm just a person. I have likes, dislikes, I have opinions, and all that stuff bleeds through to what I do. And they say, well, you can trust us because we're not going to misuse that. But they've proven over and over and over again that they will misuse it. J. Edgar Hoover had enemies lists, and he was working to make these people's lives miserable, and they were using all these federal powers that they have to destroy people's lives. By sifting through this so-called metadata, they may identify potential leads with respect to folks who might engage in terrorism. Well, we all know that their definition of terrorism in every government, every dictatorial regime, inevitably starts going to, to the area of people who criticize what the government's doing. When you become a political target of the gray state, they're going to use anything they can. So if they have a total surveillance state, but they can just look at your Facebook page without a warrant, now they can use that against you. And I'm convinced there are certain politicians out there that if they could put their political opponents in the camps, they would just do it. They haven't crossed the line to where that would be possible. But what they can do is they can change the way people feel. And I'll offer an example of this, smoking. We banish smokers to parking garages and predetermined locations 25 feet from a building entrance. Smoking is really not socially acceptable anymore. How were they able to do that? And the answer is that they were able to pass more restrictive anti-smoking laws because they were able to make smoking socially unacceptable. If they had the authority to do it, if they could do it, if it were socially acceptable for them to do it, they would take their, their political opponents and round them up and put them in internment camps. People say, well, that's ludicrous. No one would ever actually do that. Well, we did it. During World War II, we did it to the Japanese Americans and some German Americans as well. In fact, we even called them concentration camps. England did it in Ireland during uh, what they call the Troubles, euphemistically, where they would intern people at what they called Her Majesty's Pleasure, which means they would keep people and turn there in prison indefinitely. Now we're saying, well, we can do that too. All we have to do is call someone a terrorist and we can lock them up pretty much as long as we want. Jewel beat. What just got passed was the National Defense Authorization Act. Jewel what people don't realize, because it wasn't reporting in mainstream media, it completely finally put the nail in the coffin on the Constitution. When the Patriot Act was introduced after 9-11, its most draconian measures were not exercised right away publicly. It was much more private. Well, now with the, the passing of this new Senate bill, they're advertising, they're saying it's here now. Have you heard of uh, Posse Comitatus? You know that, right? Yeah, I mentioned that today, but I'm not familiar with it. It strictly prohibits and is very clear that the military is not to be used against American citizens, not to be active on American Jewel soil. Beat. They cannot arrest you. They cannot act with force within American soil. That's what the police is for. The Defense Authorization Act completely bypasses the Posse Comitatus Act, which is saying that the military can now act like the police force. Now they are one. There's no separation of power. Being military police, that's kind of our job too. Yeah, but not not on U.S. soil, right? Actually, we're going to be certified as U.S. soil. Law enforcement. Everything they go through to be certified. We're going to be doing the same thing. It's almost like we'll be 
going through the academy like they did. What they're doing is turning the United States into Iraq, and, and that's really no, no exaggeration. The same legal structure that applies in Iraq under the laws of war is what they're claiming to be able to do here at home in the United States. There's no, no legal barriers anymore as far as they're concerned. And that any American citizen accused of being a terrorist does not deserve a jury trial, but instead will be an enemy combatant under martial law, under military law, under the laws of war. Authorizing military force, that's killing you, military detention, and military trial, or rendition to some foreign country. If they have any reason to want to detain you, they have that. They don't need to acknowledge your Fourth Amendment rights. There's no judge, there's no jury, there's no need for evidence. As long as we're at war, we can convert this crime, this criminal offense, terrorism, into an act of war at our option, and now we can do whatever we want. We are authorized to take action against enemy belligerents under international law. It seems like that could happen to anybody. All it takes is for a couple of people to say, hey, you're a terrorist, and you're going to get picked up. You're not going to be able to talk to a lawyer. You're not going to have any rights in that situation. And when they say, I want my lawyer, you tell them, shut up. The Constitution guarantees due process. It does not guarantee judicial process. If you had a family member of yours arrested for any reason, let's say, just say they're guilty of a crime, wouldn't you at least want to know? Wouldn't you want to know that the facts will be disputed in a court of law and that they stand a chance that if they are innocent that that can be found? They might even send you to Syria and have you get tortured by the Syrian secret police find out what you know. Or they'll use one of the forms of torture that they've Jeez. determined are actually not torture. It's all semantics. They say, well, this isn't torture, so we can do it. And what they're saying now is this isn't internment, so we can do Jeez. that too. Jeez. I have two words for you. Predator drones. <laughs> you think I'm joking? The Nobel Peace Prize winner has just announced and authorized that he has told the CIA that it can assassinate American citizens in violation of federal law and in violation of treaties to which the U.S. is a party. They don't write these laws not to use them. I mean, where, where does he get his power? He had al Walaki and his son murdered. These were American citizens. al is a terrorist. Probably the most significant risk to the U.S. homeland. We certainly want to neutralize him. It's a huge change of presidential powers that has occurred. And it's because totally of right and totally constitutional. It's the it's one right thing to I kill anybody without the due process of law and have a kill list. Are you off. kidding me? President Obama has used more targeted killings than the Bush administration mm. ever did. This is a program that amounts to the executive branch saying, trust us. But when the president can kill whoever he wants, mm. then he's not a president anymore. He's a king. His citizenship should no more serve as a shield than a sniper for shooting down on an innocent crowd should be protected from a SWAT team. And these guys probably are bad dudes, and, and that's how it's used right now. But if you study history and you know that you allow this kind of abuse of power by the federal government, you undermine the rule of law, I fear what happens to us down the road. Germany, China, could only dream of what the United States just did, because this just opens the floodgates for oppression and tyranny. The United States just 50, 60 years ago was the example of the world for freedom. Jeez. Now you notice our criminal government never criticizes Russia or China anymore because they can't. And China passed its own NDAA Jeez. and said, hey, we can arrest and kill people secretly too. Look, the Americans do it. It's just codifying into law that the United States Jeez. Constitution and Bill of Rights are null and void. We don't care what your guys' intentions are. We know what this can be used for later on, you know, because there's a reason you don't chip away at liberties, because at some point you end up with a tyranny. The minute you stop fighting for that freedom, it, it's going to diminish and ultimately disappear. And once it's gone, we're not going to get it back. I got three kids! I want them to grow up with freedom! Don't you want your kids to have freedom? They're not going to have it! What I don't understand, though, is how come more people aren't awake to it when it's so blatantly obvious to so many of us. Is the conditioning really that pervasive? People who go along with the system saying, like, I will support the system, I will do it, I'm not going to question it. Those are very naive people. God has ordained the police officers in a sense to restrain evil. We're to submit. As long as we submit to state authority, continue to yield our liberties, and modify our behavior to fit the mold of federal approval, this unlucky person being dragged away will not be us. And as long as at least we believe our freedoms are not at stake, 
we will be allowed to return to the comfortable complacency of our padded, Julie. regimented lives. You're not safe. Just because you're working for the system, you feel like you're protected? You're not protected. We don't have that anymore, and the American Julie. public couldn't care less. It's just, it's astounding. I don't care, I don't, yeah. care. I don't think they're American citizens. I understand. He was a 16-year-old teenager Julie. from Colorado. I understand. You okay. don't care? Really? No. I support it completely. You support it completely? So indefinite detention Jeez. for Americans and assassination of Americans, absolutely, because Obama said it. Absolutely. All right. Happy Fourth Jeez. of July. Why should people give a shit? This is our country. This is our home. And we have rights uh, given to us by the Constitution. Without the Constitution, the United States is just another piece of property, and that's it. Best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. I think it is an imperfect document, and I think it is a document that reflects uh, some deep flaws uh, in uh, American culture. The Constitution reflected a enormous blind spot in this culture that carries on until this day, and and. Uh, and that the framers uh, had that same blind spot. What's frustrated people is, is that I have not been able to force Congress to implement every aspect of what I uh, said in 2008. Our founders designed a system that makes it more difficult to bring about change than I would like. Our ancestors tried to protect us against this omnipotent type of power. That was the whole idea. And I really think it's more about the nature of government to always be as big of a cancer as the host will tolerate. The limits of tyranny will be prescribed by the, the tolerance of the oppressed. Now, I know some people want me to bypass Congress and change the laws on my own. Believe me, the idea of, of doing things on my own is very tempting. So what happens is we see these small erosions of our rights, and we get to the point where people say, well, can't you just live with that? If you say, no, I can't live with that, well, then people go, well, what kind of a net job are you that you can't live with that? Tyranny is the mainstream drug of choice for everybody, and even we can be tyrannous in liberty. So you got to have liberty. Well, maybe they like being in prison. And that's where we see the shift, the change happen. Over time, they say, well, why did we even have that right in the first place? Was that even necessary to have? Like, like we were discussing earlier, when you have the news headlines covering Fast and Furious and the drug trade, arms trade, trafficking, and no one cares, no one gives a shit. Why doesn't that matter? It doesn't matter to me. I'm sure they'd have a good reason if they did. Is it because of oh, uh, Obama, or is it because he's a Democrat, or just because you trust the government that much? Oh, all three. All three. So you trust the government, and you would let them kill you because they know what's best. Absolutely. Say that one more time. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I don't even know what else to say at this point. <laughs> Have a great day. Oh, my God. The great state is inevitable. It's coming. Technically, it's already here. We want to urge you, today's Viper searches did not come from any particular threat. One TSA official says intelligence tells them they should be focusing on the highways as well as the airports. They also warned that terrorists are going to be striking at home, that terrorists now are going to be domestic. The menace of terrorism has mutated. Homegrown terrorism is one of my biggest concerns. It's happening in our own backyard. They're trying to indoctrinate us into a telltale society where we all think each other are suspects. They're recruiting truck drivers into the First Observer Highway Security Program to say something if they see something. Be responsible uh, citizens, report that. Bottom line is this, if you see something suspicious, say something about it. Everybody should be, in, be aware of what's going on on the road. They're close to a million Americans signed up on this list saying that they will report their neighbors to the government. You have financial rewards if you spy on your neighbor. In some cases, you're required to. We can reference the story of the city in Vietnam. In one night, Viet Cong rolled in, rounded up 4,000 Vietnamese men, and had them all executed by the next morning. And the CIA just could not figure out how they did it. Well, the answer is they have a system of informers. And what are we being taught to do? If you see something suspicious in the parking lot or in the store, say something immediately. Report suspicious activity to your local police or sheriff. Well, what's suspicious activity? Again, in this sort of Orwellian nightmare we're descending into, people are not engaging in critical thinking skills, so suspicious activity is, is intentionally vague 
Because hell, to different people, anything's going to be suspicious. It's wrong to carry a gun, and if you have information about people who are carrying guns, you've got to share that. Thank you for doing your part to help keep our hometowns safe. Those who have become completely and utterly dependent upon the government for literally life to live. You look at food stamps, welfare, say what you want about the compassion behind these programs. The fact of the matter is you're creating dependency. And so it's going to be very easy to turn the masses on these groups of people who are independent. These militias, generally, these are people who know how to provide for themselves. They're survivalists. They're people who know how to live off of the land. We can't have that. We don't want other people's learning to become independent. So the powers that be want to discourage you from learning about self-sufficiency and independence and be fearful of these groups that are. They want to attach to us these labels and social stigmas so that the general public is going to look at, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And you see folks waving tea bags around. The threat these groups pose is evolving. We see these people being portrayed as being on the fringe, unstable or even dangerous. And what we're doing is we're making the dissent socially unacceptable. There's going to be small pockets of resistance as the economy gets worse. You're going to have more and more militias gaining credibility and numbers. It is imperative that they demonize these groups, create fear. These people are terrorists. It's basic psychology. You dehumanize your enemy and you make them a threat. During World War I, there was an organization called the Law and Order League. They would go out on the streets and they would round up men who were the draft age and would force them to prove that they had either fulfilled their draft obligation or were not eligible for the draft. These weren't even agents of the government. These were just people. These people carried badges and they had all the authority of the federal government behind them. I pledge to be of service to Barack Obama. Yes, we can. They've been conditioned, just like the soldiers are conditioned, to hate their enemy. Yes, we these people are conditioned to hate their political opponents. We have these pseudo-volunteer organizations now. We really haven't defined what their role in all of this is either. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well-funded. Now we begin to appreciate the magnitude of our opposition. This is not an obsolete single tyrant thousands of miles away who threatens everyone's freedom publicly, but a convoluted mess of legislation and social evolution whose enforcers believe that they are working in the best interest of all and whose ranks are filled by our own friends and neighbors. They say revolutions are won by the 3% and that may be true, but the gray state, the real gray state, is the 97% will not have their entitlements threatened by a minority. And at the first sign that these government subsidies will end, will finally act to betray us. It's kind of working against us to care about other people. As long as they're safe, as long as they're okay, as long as they're not being searched, as long as they're not having their stuff taken away from them, I've got mine, I'm okay. And next thing you know, you've got people showing up on your front door saying, it's time to go. We changed the law and now you fit. Police department in your home! What we have now is the illusion of a free republic. It's called incrementalization. Hitler did not have the Jews rounded up into camps overnight. It was step by step. First they had to show their papers everywhere they went. Then they needed tattoos. Then they needed to relocate to labor camps. Then they were exterminated. To say that these things couldn't happen, which you hear all the time, oh, that couldn't happen, this is America. Who the hell are you? What, because you're American, it makes you somehow different from the rest of the world? It is not unfathomable to believe that human nature is about only a few things, power and control.
when they start rounding us up later, it'll be a lot easier for the public to consume that. Here's something fun. When you get five minutes out of your busy day, what I recommend doing is going on Google or YouTube and checking out FEMA concentration camps. This is some type of residential center internment camp right here. You can see the gates, both sides. These both have barbed wire on them and they're facing inward, of course. You can see it's all fenced in right here. Once you cross this threshold, you're in there. Now these residential areas can house over 30,000 people at one time. Now, are you telling me that there's 30,000 people in one location that we need to be worried about? Look at Germany, an advanced civilization, and they fell into, into a despotism in a span of 10 years after an economic collapse. It can happen here. You think it can't happen here? What's this people. concentration camp thing you're talking about? What is this thing about bringing foreign troops into the United States? What scenarios do you live in? This is a historic pattern. This has happened in the past. Documents are out, the detention camps, and the internment camps, the re-education camps. They're hiring for positions in these camps. These institutions are becoming active at the same time that this defense bill was passed. And now that the economy is on the verge of collapsing. There's no markings of any type of business. This is not a correctional facility. Got a call from a buddy of mine that's uh, serving in the Army right now. He's saying that this is already staffed. They already have military personnel on the grounds. Something is going down. You know something's on the horizon because people, look, they don't do this just to be safe. They do it because they're prepping for something. They're preparing for something. They are prepping for an economic collapse, the likes of which no generation has seen in hundreds of years. This is going to be devastating to every American family. We have printed and borrowed without limitation on a scale that the American people don't know. In so doing, we have destroyed the value of our currency and our property. All of these things are going to come together. It's, it's kind of a perfect storm. We are already in the abyss, and our empire is unfolding right now. Our monetary empire is unfolding before our very eyes. People say, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? Motherfucker, it's happening. It's happening right now. It's happening right now. And what you see happening already in the markets is a reflection of the recognition that we are tied to what's happening in the Eurozone. We've already shipped trillions of dollars over to the European Central Bank in the hopes that they could postpone this inevitable collapse. We are about to plunge headfirst into the third world. The prosperity you and I grew up with, the cheap access to food, clothing, fuel, never again. Looters are running free. They've been patrolling downtown all night long. If I could offer anyone advice, get out of the city. There'll be rioting, there'll be police going door to door, gun confiscations, spread lines. You wouldn't want to be in an urban environment if there was some sort of societal collapse. We have 48 million people on food stamps right now. So when the economy collapses, literally millions, tens of millions of people dependent upon that system. And they know nothing else. All these people are going to be looking for resources. If you have resources they don't have, there are people that are going to feel entitled to try and take them. People surrounded the car. They dragged the driver out. And beat him bloody. I had uh, some friends that served with me in the Army who were Cobra pilots and then they ended up flying Hueys and other aircraft in the Air National Guard during Katrina. And they told me that uh, the whole experience was terrible. People on the ground in New Orleans shot at them. They said it was reminiscent of Somalia. Their lives in extreme danger that I can. Oh my goodness. There's a theory that applies to disasters. It also applies to personal survival, and that's what we call the yo-yo theory. Y-O-Y-O, -Y -Y -O. you're on your own. And if you don't know how to farm and produce food for yourself, to sow and reap, harvest, game over. You have been taught purposely not to have those skills. A guy who was originally an accountant can't provide for his family, can't defend his family, can't do anything. He's helpless, he's bleeding. Somebody help me, God damn it. And the government steps in. Here's our solution. When you got a problem, you call the National Guard. They're the nation's 911. <laughs> Overnight, police in New Orleans enforced a dusk-to-dawn curfew. The police and National Guard going street by street, instructions to disarm anyone inside. We will take all weapons. Los Angeles, Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore, Washington, 
Chicago. Those are the areas where I would see the military being deployed. A future where the federal government literally controls distribution of power, food, water, is only one sort of widespread disaster away. You look at Hurricane Katrina, they turned the Superdome in New Orleans into a giant FEMA camp, and they didn't get water out there for five days. You really think their job is to feed you and protect you? That's not what FEMA exists for. They exist for management, federal emergency management. And there's no better way to manage you than by controlling food. Then they kind of decide who's hungry and who's not. And again, I think they'll do whatever they can to exercise restraint, but it depends on what they encounter. Smash it! It'll be easy then to play off the American public against each other. If you are unable to produce food for yourself, you're going to be more likely to take human life to have someone else do it for you. You're going to be more likely to say, yeah, the government's murdering militia members, but if I don't support that, who's going to feed me? You might have to pick sides someday. Are you going to stand with your neighbors? Are you going to stand with the government and get fed? You know, what other option will you have? fabric of society is changing before us. We are definitely looking at a, a transformation of our society, and it's not necessarily um, a good thing. And so what we're calling on active duty military and police to do is to simply stand down and to refuse to comply with, with unlawful orders. But if they continue provoking violence, violence is what they're going to get. That's not what any of us want. You don't want to think about the stuff that you're going to have to do. Let me shoot an American. Yeah. What I fear is that the powers that be understand that their time is limited, that eventually we will win if given enough time. My concern is, is they will try to use the only tool they have, which is force, to try to crush the revolution before we can be successful in a peaceful manner. That's my great fear. What people need to realize is that they are creating this problem. They want to push people over the edge to create this chaos. They're gonna to try to capitalize on it. Their vision for what's next is a global fed and even more power. Power being stripped from the people, being stripped from the communities, being stripped from the states and centralized and then, and then internationalized. And what you're seeing is the various powers of the world are positioning themselves on this grand chessboard like Zygmunt Brzezinski of the Obama administration wrote about. They are all positioning their pieces because they know this system's going down. That's the dirty secret. It's all planned. They planned it because they knew it was going to fail. The United Nations should play an essential role in stabilizing world population. You look at the people who are controlling or pulling the strings. The Honorable Henry A. Kissinger. The actual controlling people of the world and the globe and how they perceive humanity. It's disturbing and it's also psychotic because these people don't care about human rights. These people don't care about human liberties or freedom. They treat you as a number. This is, in all the globalist documents, their whole program is absolute war against humanity, a final revolution against everything good, a scientific dictatorship. They don't really care whether you have liberties or not, except in terms of how much it allows them to exploit you. The negative impact of population growth on all of our planetary ecosystems is becoming appallingly evident. They could care less of what happens to you. They, they squeeze slowly any kind of human right or critical thinking from you. These are deep-seated, deep-rooted, evil individuals, a cabal of individuals who have run the world for centuries. We are being hit scientifically. We are in a petri dish. We are under assault. We must resist the takeover. Their allegiance is to the global bankers. Their allegiance is to the, the new world order, not to the United States, not to the Constitution. Not to freedom. The New World Order has no legitimacy. 
and that we as a people are not afraid, and we are waking up to the robber barons and the big banks who are looting the economy of the Federal Reserve. Well. If uh, we decide to be sedated consumers in perpetuity and uh, to effectively adopt uh, the title of sheeple, then yes, I guess the, the Republic as we know it could go out of existence. And within the next 20 or 30 years, we'll look at something like Brazil. Tens of millions of people living in poverty with a very few people at the top controlling most of the capital and dictating the lives of everyone else. We have become decadent. We've become proud. We've become arrogant, and worst of all, we have abandoned our Bill of Rights. We've let them take it. If we allow democracy through negligence and carelessness and the crude ambition for money, power and glory of politicians to be handed away, as we already have in Britain, to a supranational entity which we do not elect and cannot control, then you become just another police state. The freedom of the people will no longer be guaranteed by their own voice and their own vote. There will be an increasing gulf fixed between the governing class, which will wield all realistic power, and the governed, who will wield none. We'll be right back to square one. And all the work of your founding fathers will have been carelessly set at naught by the very people to whom you have entrusted the defence of that constitution against all comers. Your voice is the most sacred oath you have taken. You are listening and obeying orders from pirates who are taking their orders from the big banks. Understand what you are doing here today and what you have done. The hour is late. We are forced to choose right now between 1774 America or 1934 Germany. Which one is it going to be? We are now in exactly the same position our forefathers were in 1774. Almost a mirror reflection. King George, until the fight had started, did not claim the power to order colonists murder. But your president now claims the authority to use drone strikes or anything else against you. It's even worse than what King George claimed the power to do. They are asserting the power to treat you, the American people, exactly the same as an occupied, conquered enemy nation. What is that? It's treason! We have three ways to deal with the government. We have the soap box, we have the ballot box, and we have the cartridge box. They catch you violating their unconstitutional laws, they will, when they please, send armed men to work their will upon you. And people, innocent of any crime save the one these tyrants created, will die resisting. If it came to the point and they started rounding people up, I would resist. I would resist, I would not go to the camp. I would rather die in the street with gun in my hand than die in a camp. And if I have to die, I'm gonna die a free man. We will not die! You wish to stay free and to pass down that freedom to your children's children. You can do no less than become the lawbreakers that they have unconstitutionally made of you. You are the modern American revolutionaries, but unlike them, all you have to do is preserve what was already given to you by the blood of other patriots. You have to make sure it's not in vain. As long as your heart beats, as long as you draw breath, you have a duty to stand. 
We will not comply, and we will resist. Accept that fact. Embrace it. And resolve to be the very best, most successful lawbreakers you can be. And you will stay free. When does the info war turn into the shooting war? For the individuals who are put in circumstances where they're justified doing violence against agents of the state, it already is. For the people who defended their home against a police invasion were found by the Supreme Court in Minnesota that they were justified in resisting that invasion of their home, it was already a shooting war. For the insurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan defending their home, it is already a shooting war and not an info war. And for people that are directly threatened by the violence of government every day on the streets in the United States, it already is a shooting war. But the way that you defeat it is by winning the info war. The thing you have to remember is the task that we have before us today is a task that's never been attempted before in history successfully. No republic, once it's gone corrupt and long in the tooth, has ever been resuscitated, ever. Look at history. I pray every day that we can revive this republic. I don't know it's possible. It's up to the determined minority to make it happen to shape history. I have my doubts, I do, but I know that we have to try. We're coming to a point in human history where statism, I think, is coming to an end because people are waking up to its true nature. Human productivity, prosperity, that the government can never stop is, is going to empower us to see past the paradigm of statism. It's a message of empowerment. It's a message of celebrating the, the, the divinity in every human being, the, the inalienable rights that, that, that we all enjoy. I can down to the conclusion very simply, freedom is popular. <laughs> People, it's not my message, it's a message of America. Zen libertarianism, to me, is something that has allowed me to really fully appreciate the epicness of every moment that I am fortunate enough to enjoy on this planet. If you really understand the physics of reality, the fact that every cell in our body is replaced every seven years, that at the atomic level there is no such thing as matter as much as there is waves of energy that matter is composed of and of uh, arranging the molecules in your brain to engage in the rest of the world to be a part of the universe to enjoy the experience that it is to be a spinning wave of energy a spiral of light that we, that we are as human beings America you still consist of nothing but free, beautiful, independent human beings capable of being the alphas of your own lives. The truth is empowering and sets you free. And there is no such thing as government. You can see it for what it is. There's not a police officer, it's just a man in a blue costume with a gun. And the guy in the courtroom isn't a judge who has some superior moral claim to your life. He's just a guy in a black robe. And you're able to see the matrix. You're able to wake up and see all of the code behind the language of society and the way that we think and to be able to free your mind from that prison of fear and being able to step back and never be caught up in the fears of statism, to be afraid of losing your life, to never be afraid of dying because you come to accept its inevitability. That's Zen libertarianism. At the end of the day, we all die. We're all going to die. No one gets out of here alive. 
And so what counts is what we do and, and who we are. We really need to wake up and we need to say, we're not gonna use violence to enforce this. We're not gonna use force to enforce this. We're gonna settle this in a more civilized manner. There isn't much chance of avoiding the quote unquote hard landing that we've been discussing. It is a precipice that some states have already plunged over that the federal government threatens to follow. What can you do about it? It's the same thing that's been going on since the beginning of time. We have no power. That's the other lie. The other lie is that, that these systems can't be wrecked. They can be wrecked simply by an individual saying no. Let's be a man in America and a woman. <laughs> All we got to do is stand up and say no. There will always be somebody who wants to be free and is willing to fight to defend that. Human beings need to be free in order to achieve their full potential. Love is the core of this second American revolution. <laughs> we do have the power. It would be startlingly easy to reverse all of this is what people do not generally understand. The elites in every case always believe they are invincible and they never, ever are. Regimes always fail and it's only a matter of time before everything comes crumbling down and a new beginning happens. Freedom and being free will always be there. All we have to do is essentially refuse to play ball. You get enough people to do that and just refuse to go along. It doesn't involve a bloody revolution. And in fact, for this one to really truly be unique from revolutions in the past, it has to be that way. And that's it. And it's up to us, guys. This is no joke. Tyranny is the old idea. It's over and done with. We don't need more tyranny. Change this country, go back to our roots, decide that we want to live in a free country and not in a country rapidly drifting toward totalitarianism. We need to reverse the course. I want you to imagine this. Imagine if every single soldier, sailor, airman, and marine understood what you understand, knew what you know, felt what you feel about freedom. Imagine if they had that conviction in their hearts and in their minds and in their souls to be a warrior for liberty. Would you fear them anymore? I'm letting go and releasing this medal because love is the most powerful force that we can employ as human beings on this planet. I don't want us to suffer this again and I don't want our children to suffer this again. So I'm giving these back. And it's been said that you should never doubt that a small group of people who have firm convictions can change the world because that's the only way it's ever happened before. It's a bright time, it's a hopeful time. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens because they are on the run, <laughs> you know. We're on the march and the empire is on the run. One drop of truth, as you know, is an antidote to an entire bucket of bull. But once your eyes are open, that's it. You're taking the red pill, and from that moment on, you are lost to the elites. They no longer have any power over your mind. Ideas spread, they can't stop them. An idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any in terms of resistance, say no every chance you get. Every chance you get, say no. Let no man say we did nothing in this, our darkest hour.